season. Wilson spent just two years under center in Denver, went 11-19 as a starter, and will leave the Broncos with $85 million in dead money over the next two seasons. Eagles center Jason Kelsey announced his retirement after 13 seasons in the NFL. At his emotional 40-plus minute press conference, Kelsey left no stone unturned thanking his coaches, teammates, and especially Eagles fans. The Chiefs placed a franchise tag on cornerback Legereus Sneed, while the Buccaneers and wide receiver Mike Evans agreed to a two-year $52 million contract, according to NFL Network insider Mike Garofolo. Evans has generated 10 1,000-yard seasons in his 10 years. This has been NFL Network Now on the Westwood One Radio Network. Wesley Financial Group is not a law firm. This story is called The Ugly Truth About Timeshare. If you think you've done your family a favor by buying a timeshare, you need my help. Hello, I'm Chuck McDowell, founder of Wesley Financial Group. Ten years ago, I started helping folks cancel their timeshare. In the process, started what's now called the timeshare cancellation industry. The ugly truth is when you buy a timeshare, you can't tell me how much it's going to cost or when it's going to end. I recently helped a couple that had their maintenance fees go from $800 to $3,200 a year. They also received a $4,000 assessment for a hurricane that was over 1,000 miles away. Sound crazy? The crazy thing is, this never ends. Call my office now. If we take you as a client, I guarantee we'll cancel your time share or you'll pay nothing. Call for your free information kit. Call 800-462-3333. That's Six o'clock. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Less than a week away from free agents legal tampering period and teams getting their cap space in order to make a splash or just solidifying one of the worst trades in NFL history as the Denver Broncos released quarterback Russell Wilson yesterday just two years ago. They traded for him, now leaving an $85 million dead cap charge, the most in NFL history for context. That's more than the last two dead cap charges combined. Now the 35-year-old super former Super Bowl MVP is free to sign wherever he would like to ride. 3 p.m. today is the deadline for players to be franchise tagged. You saw Legereus Sneed tagged yesterday. A couple more players who could get tagged of a long-term deal is not agreed upon. Colts wide receiver Michael Pittman, Jags outside linebacker Josh Allen, and Ravens defensive lineman Justin Matabike are all expected to be retained. New deal or not. And a trade in the NFL. The Bills send offensive lineman Ryan Bates to the Chicago Bears. The Bears had previously tried to sign Bates to an offer sheet, but Buffalo matched. Now the Bears send a fifth-round pick in this year's draft to secure the versatile offensive lineman. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Balls. This is 104.5 The Zone. Tuesday morning on Ramon, Kayla, and Will as the full show is back together with lots to discuss as we get you to the middle of your week. What's next for Russell Wilson as the Denver Broncos pay a whole lot of money for him to not play quarterback in the Mile High City? We discuss that. Take a look at how the Tennessee Titans will address the wide receiver position this offseason with players both on the roster and rumored to be in the picture in free agency. 
CBS Sports and NFL Network's Charles Davis at 8.05, Austin Price at 8.30, and our weekly visit with Ron Slay at 9.20. 615-737-1045, the number streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV, where you see the faces of Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh making the show happen. I'm Will Bowling. It is Tuesday, March the 5th. How are we doing? Welcome back, Kayla. Thank you, and just have to deal with my voice today, guys. Let's just say it's, it's, a, little, right. it's a little sultry today. You sound like a <laughs> cigarette smoker. I do not smoke, for the record. <laughs> you, sound like, you sound like the ladies from the 90s movies that used to sit in the store. Yes, right darling, window. just have me another cigarette. <laughs> It's, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to take some getting used to. I know. It's going to take some getting used to. How was the trip? It was good. It was really good. I I was just telling Ramon, too. I was like, this is what happens to me sometimes. And it's not like I'm staying up late hours or anything. But sometimes when you get in a different environment and you're on a plane and all the good stuff that comes along with traveling, you endure something fun on the way back. So this was, I guess, my treat. Yeah, was, was was the raspy voice. It so was. hopefully it will return. Raspy voice like a Jada kiss. I can yes. go on and on. I'm going to stop with the references this morning. <laughs> it's a Jada kiss, the lady from the movie smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm done. But I, it was all, it was good. It was good. It was not as warm as I would have liked it oh, to have been, but we still managed to uh, put in plenty of pool time because when you're down there, you can't not be like trying to soak in some sun, even exactly. if it's windy and partly cloudy. Right. Um, the weather, you said it was yeah. just cool and windy. The weather everywhere. You know what that right sounds now. like? That sounds like whenever we used to, uh, when I say used to go, because we ain't went in a couple of years, I feel like now. But when we go to Destin for yeah. spring break, that's just, this is what it feels like. Like, so it, I, this is some bougie stuff. I'd always find a verbo. <laughs> Verbo with the heated pool. Sure. Well, I tried to anyway. I had to catch myself with that type of stuff. Must be nice. Man, no, 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 <laughs> no. Let's have to heat Could our own pools. Could be my Verbo. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. We just went down there one year, and the kids were still trying to jump in a very cold pool. And I'm like, I didn't know Oof. Florida's supposed to be this cool right now. So just a lesson learned. Get a heated pool if you're going to go to Verbo. Uh, Destin and use a Verbo for I agree. Break. Which, Middle Tennessee is on the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think most of Middle Tennessee is about to go through spring break. What, uh, last or Yesterday was awesome here, by the way. Uh, yesterday Weather-wise. was. Weather? Oh, yeah. Weather was beautiful sure was. Oh, my goodness. Got me an outside walk-in and everything else. That was beautiful. I ain't gonna nice. lie. Um, well, you didn't burn the place down, you guys. So Did not. Yes. We're, we're not yet. Now. <laughs> not <laughs> yet. Yeah, we still got time. Uh, but good vibes, though. Good vibes. Always. Bottle service? No, none of that. Yeah. I know. Somebody in this building got to do bottle service. It's Buck. Buck. No one can take that title. Uh, it's somebody, that. man. Well, he he had like a tequila shot he was taking right after the show yesterday. Did he really? What I heard, to celebrate his three years of being on this radio station. Oh, that's right. Okay, okay. Congratulations. After the show is when okay. he was going to take it. So he's off the clock. They can't blame him. All. And I saw his shirt was off on primetime. Robert Walsh, can you fill us in on whatever was happening last night on the A to Z Sports YouTube page? Yeah, uh, so I always take my shirt off. I, I always do the oh. primetime show shirtless. Uh, yeah. But I pump faked everybody last night by coming on with a shirt, and then I played a video, and then my shirt was gone. But it wasn't just me. Buck shirt was also gone. Uh, it looked like he was wearing a shirt from all the chest hair. It looked like he had a, <laughs> a finely knitted sweater on. Oh. But uh, we were both shirtless discussing Jason Kelsey's uh, future. Smart. And a lot of people took uh, took screenshots. Oh. So now oh. there are receipts. That's about right. right. Screenshots were definitely appropriate for an event like that. I call it an event, Bert. Well, the the problem is is Buck's facial hair and, and head hair grows all clean and neatly, like the opposite of Joe Dirt, not white and trashy. <laughs> but his chest hair is, is very patchy. He needs to he needs to get a, a hair transplant to the chest and figure out what he's going to do because it, it doesn't co- it's not enough coverage. It's like the Titans secondary last year they couldn't he oh, cannot no. cover the whole field. Mm. It doesn't know what it's going to do. So uh, mm. I, I need Buck to to figure out his chest hair situation. But in the meantime, I'll I'll still be doing primetime shirtless if anybody would like to partake. What I hear is What's Buck Rising is the Christian Fulton of chest hair. There you go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, will Buck's dad also now come after you the way Christian Uh-oh. Fulton's dad came uh, after us? 
got shots fired. For anything they did wrong? That's interesting. My guy's ready. Can, can we trade Buck's bad chest hair for a like day three pick <laughs> in the draft? Can you flip that for anything? No? <laughs> Can't flip that. It's gonna be. I, I'll I, give him cash considerations to shave off whatever the heck is on his upper lip. Yes. What that that sorry excuse of a mustache. I, I will. I will happily give him a player to be named later to do that. Unfortunately, the mustache is here to stay. I tried to make a draft bet with him, uh, but in in uh, in the proper comp- compensation, he would like me to shave my hair off Ooh. for his mustache. What? I'm like, you've had the mustache for like three or four weeks, dude. No. I've had this hair since I was a freshman in college. Not a fair trade. Yeah, you're not. Not, not a hair trade. Either. I told him I would do mullet for mustache. Where okay. if I lost, I would cut my hair into a mullet. But then he said that's not really a punishment, and I would enjoy it. And he's not wrong. Yeah, you're right. That's true. <laughs> I would have the ultimate amount of lettuce if they would allow me to shave my hair into a mullet. I don't know if Cheyenne would get any work done around the house. We would we would be uh, we would be in a, a crowded household, if you will. <laughs> I thought but you were going to say the I opposite. Did, I did too. No, I thought she would hate it. it. Be taking a whole lot of paternity leave. <laughs> wow. Whoa. Okay. Get new cats right or something. There. What's going on? Uh, gotta be. Gotta be. Okay. I was not it's expecting you to say there. something like that, Bert. What is wrong with you, man? So I'm in there making coffee this morning too, right? Yeah. By the way, uh, the sweet blue is the uh, the the eighth and rose blend. In nice, now, okay. The sweet blue, sweet blue is black. Uh, back, oh, not sweet blue, sweet blue is, is black. black. Sweet blue is back, okay. Racism is dead, Stanley. <laughs> we trying to kill it, man. We trying to kill it, okay. Uh, but here, here, I'm in there making the coffee, and I'm in there doctoring up my my coffee and stuff like that, and I hear footsteps, and I feel like I know it's Bert, so I'm just staring into the hallways. I look at him walk by. He look at me standing there fixing my coffee. Nobody said a thing. And then he get to the printer over here and said, what you staring at me like that for? He always looking at me like that, man. I, I don't know whether he wants to fight me or what sometimes, man. <laughs> it was just the funniest comment because that felt like a elementary school, middle uh-huh. school, just like, what you staring at me like that for? It, it was just hilarious to me. I've had that happen in like elementary school to where your friends walk by the classroom and they just disrupt you, and Bert was disrupting me. Oh, yeah, See how I I'm loved that, you? like, back oh, in the day. Oh, my gosh. Like, I'm in here making coffee, Bert. What are you doing this morning, huh? Well, I've been in a routine of just drinking the coffee here and not using my coffee pot at home. But last night, I finally decided to put my timer coffee pot back on. But I have not done this uh, on the schedule, I think, since the last time change. So... I had a fresh pot of coffee that was beeping and smelled really nice that woke me up at 4 a.m. this morning. Nicely done. Oh. But honestly, I love doing that and because I immediately went back to sleep for another hour and a half. And <laughs> I love doing that because it reminds me I can keep sleeping. Like, if I wake up two hours before I'm supposed to get up, it's like a, it's like a let's go. Yeah. It's like I can do this again yeah. and just go through the whole process and just go right back to sleep. But then I also had nice coffee again when I woke up. So again. it was hot still. It was, oh, yes. Because okay. the, the timer, I think, stays on for like an hour and a half. Okay. Or two hours before it just goes off. Perfect. So we've we've brought our coffee into work today. Nicely done. For the man. first time. I used to always nice. think that was a bougie thing to do. No, it's just knowing how to use your appliances. Now in today's True. day and age, you can get a a cheap coffee pot on a timer. It's not expensive at all. Yeah, yeah, I I, I know, but if like with me, I would just get a pot. Turn it on and turn it off, and that would be it. Like using all the functions of it. Yeah, right. I've never delved into it any further. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like never done that before. To where it's just like, okay, yes, yeah, got a timer remote, and then of course you can just make a single cup. I'm what? like, no, nah, just turn it on and turn it off. I'm making twelve cups. You're making and drinking them all. Yeah, absolutely. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five is our number. Our question of the day on Twitter at Ramon Kayla Will. Who is the least favorite player that's ever played for one of your teams? I feel like college teams, maybe there's less hate of your own players because they're just kids, guys. They're mm-hmm. just kids. Yeah. But there are some players, and maybe it's Russell Wilson for many of you, who just got released yesterday. We'll talk about that coming up next on the best fits after one of the worst trades and worst contracts in the history of the National Football League. We'll dive into that coming up In just a few minutes, we'll also take a look this morning at how the Titans will address the wide receiver position with ESPN's Jeremy Fowler linking one NFC wide receiver to the Titans. How would he fit into a crowded wide receiver room full of guys who need to prove themselves 
under a new head coach. Plus, at 8 o'clock this morning, Charles Davis of NFL Network and CBS Sports. Austin Price of AllQuest at 8.30. And Ron Slay at 9.20 to round out our number four. 615-737-1045. NFL headlines after this on 104.5 The Zone. Storms and changing weather can cause all sorts of chaos, including power outages. Well, have you considered what would happen if your home had no power right now? What's going on? It's Will Bowling here from my friends at Lee Company. I'm here to tell you a home generator can make a huge difference. If the power goes out, a home generator will keep your heating and air conditioning system running, lights on, and the appliances working. You can also count on your phones and computers to stay charged and never miss a beat. So act now and receive $500 off or special financing for up to 36 months on a new generator for your home. You heard that right. $500 off right now. All you got to do is visit Lee Company online. Go to LeeCompany.com slash promotions or call 615-567-1000 to claim this great offer. I love working with Lee Company because they've got 80 years of experience, trusted since 1944. They're open 24-7. Any of their 14 community locations here in Tennessee and two in Kentucky and Alabama. 615-567-1000. That's the number. Get $500 off or special financing on a new generator for your home. That's Lee Company. All you need.
RKW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed up by 8th and Roast. And after one of the worst trades in NFL history, a veteran quarterback is picking up the pieces. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling with you. Robert Walsh making the show happen. It leads us to ask the question at Ramon Kayla Will on Twitter. Who is your least favorite player who has played for one of your favorite teams? We know Kayla's answer. Oof. Let's not ride with that. Oh, Russ. Oh, <laughs> man, that was hard, you guys, because he he has a Super Bowl ring there, yeah, right? Yeah. But man, it was so hard to like talk good about him when deep down inside, I'm like, I do not like this guy. And media members that covered him up there would tell me stories and be like, that guy is just not real. Oh, like he will just put up a front. In terms of talking to the media, and then you hear so much in, in the background of kind of he's a tough person to to work with. Um, he's a, he can win, like he's not a bad player, but I I just look at his past and what he's been through now over the last five years, and now he's being shipped out of Broncos country. Like something's got to be just difficult in terms of working with him. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating. Russ situation is by far, uh, one of the wildest I've seen turn a nosedive career wise. Just, it seems like, uh, as far as people concerned at times, it just, for a guy that seems to be a nice guy, it seems like nobody got along with him as far as the, the, what the media would say. Now, again, I hadn't talked to any of his teammates and stuff like right. that. Uh, but the rumors were that Russ is somewhat a different dude. Uh, and I'm not sure why that changed or what changed for him, but very fascinating. I always thought Russ was a good dude. I, I don't blame you for feeling the way that you do, but knowing the the desire I have for a team in Nashville to win a championship, I'll love anybody who wins a championship here forever. Yeah. And that's just me being probably weird. And I, again, I don't blame you for feeling the way you do about him, but like I, it's just... Like going through the players that I hate who have played for my teams, like you got guys who are more interested in rap careers than they were playing football and Isaiah Wilson. You've got the, you know, over the hill players under Mike Vrabel who came here and just had no interest in being Tennessee Titans. But I feel weird asking you, Ramon, because I don't want you to throw one of your old teammates under the bus. And then for Tennessee, like it's. It's kind of hard saying that about a college kid, too. So if you want to, okay. I got one. I was going to say, if you want to abstain. I, 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 I thought long and hard about it. I could say a quarterback or two at Tennessee at the time. Yeah. Um, I could always go at a coach at it. But there's one in particular. And you know what? Someone forgive the process of what, how it happened and what happened and how you'd be persuaded. Is there a total talk? Going to Bama. Mm, That's the oh. only reason. Great pick. I got nothing against him as a person. I, w- I would absolutely think his teammates love him. They talked after the game, all those types of things. But that switching sides like that. And I say that, and Alvin Kamara was a guy that came over to Tennessee on the opposite end of it. Um, but, of course, they had no room for him there. Henry Toto was a starter at Tennessee. Yeah, right. That's the difference to me. Henry Toto yeah. also went to that team and lost the consecutive year. So he's got four years of losing that series right there. So imagine that. That's the only one that I can safely say. I'm not saying I don't like him. I didn't like the move when you're asking me that question because you're right the only other team that i had in the sense was the one that i play for and those dudes i know personally i would throw right. jacoby jones in there no nah, I'm, I'm kidding <laughs> uh jacoby was a great dude your coach knew what he was doing <laughs> he stepped out on that field trying to block jacoby you had to stop that kick return to win that game don't start with me we've done this before we have done this before but yeah. jacoby was such a dope dude like a really good teammate and while we were teammates really good friends mm-hmm. too so I couldn't throw Jacoby under there, even if he played for the Ravens or nothing. So I, the, the only one I have is the move that Henry T made because he was a starter. Is he even doing anything right now? He, he was a good decent. player for the okay. Houston Texans right. this yeah. past season. I guess good special teamer. Good. He did. And yeah. now there's double hate, too, because now I cover the Titans. I know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. AFC South. AFC now he's South back hate, in there. Baby. I feel like uh, one of your old buddies was a lot of Tennessee fans pick for a while in Arian Foster. Oh, and he no. has reconciled that with the Tennessee fan base in a lot of ways and has been welcomed back into Knoxville. But well, I had this discussion with my buddies from Tennessee who I went to, went to college with that there aren't a lot of Vols that Vols fans don't like. And for a while it was Arian Foster because he told on Fulmer and he told on the administration about giving him tacos. 
yeah, and he, things of that nature. He told his truth. And he just didn't really embrace the team. But it feels like there has been a reconciliation on both sides of that uh, since right. then. Mm-hmm. I actually made this crazy you bring him up. I got a call from somebody last night um, that was trying to get his number to connect him to the uh, Vols running backs coach. There you go. So mm-hmm. there, he's he's yeah. pretty much he's in the fold and he's embracing it. Also, Arian's done way too much. But I can understand <laughs> that being the case. I can understand him being a guy that had that type of stuff surrounded. But Arian is a very vocal, yeah. very open type of guy, and what he went through was his. And if you sit and talk to him. Um, you will understand why he felt the way he did, especially in the pre-draft stuff, especially when word got back to him from NFL people, what the coaches said about him, and you feel like they're playing with your money in a sense. So, 100%. Uh, 100%. Yeah, I'm not justifying how y'all supposed to no. feel about yeah. him. Well, that, our equivalent was Ryan Leaf, like, Ryan for Leaf so like long. That? Well, well, Ryan Leaf, I mean, Ryan Leaf's past is documented, but for so long he was so – not liked by Washington State fans because you bring up Washington State and people say, oh, Ryan Leaf? Yeah. But he's kind of turned his life around and is doing some good stuff and is in the media, so. Yeah. Who do you think Titans fans dislike more? Dennis Daly, Isaiah Wilson, or Andre Dillard? (laughs) Oh, God, Isaiah Wilson. Pick your poison. Number one. I'm probably going Isaiah Wilson. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm probably going. Recent history tells us Dillard. Recent history tells us that, or Dennis Daly. But if we're gonna be honest, the reason we don't have reason we pick those, don't pick those two, is because of him. The yeah. reason why Dillard and uh, and Daly were needed was because of Panda. Yep. And honestly, Andre Dillard still showed up. Like he still kept playing. At least he didn't just go on a yacht in South Beach and <laughs> party with his, with the money he signed with. But then again, I do think there is an element of Titans fans who blame John Robinson so much for the Isaiah Wilson debacle that they don't even hold it against him in general. It's like, no, you were so bad at this that right. you shouldn't have even been here to begin with. At least Dillard was a pro for a little bit. Excellent. And Daly had been around for a little bit. But Isaiah will be coming into his contract year right now. <laughs> and that is nuts. Yeah, that's crazy. Imagine just being on the train track for this long to get to this contract. I'm going to throw out a name for you. And I, part of me doesn't like doing this because I'm sure some of these people are very nice people. And it, this is, this was the, me. The player. Yeah, we're talking about the player. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, 2016 will despised Parrish Cox more than any human should ever dislike a player for their own team. Parrish Cox, corner for the Tennessee Titans, was miserable in 2016 for this team. And I mean, picture Jonathan Joseph in the 2020 season, but worse. And Jonathan Joseph was at least... He was a guy that was a stopgap to just come in and be a body I remember that in that one. Titans defensive backs room. He was not the answer. Parrish Cox in one game against Andrew Luck and the Colts was targeted six times for 142 yards. That's 23.7 yards per catch and a perfect passer rating when targeted oh, by God. your biggest rival in the division. A passer rating of 158.3. Mm. The real ones remember how bad Parrish Cox was for the Tennessee Titans in his last season as a pro at 29 years of age in 2016. Parrish, if you live in Nashville, I'm so sorry if you're listening to this, but you're probably not. (laughs) I'm sure you're a great guy, but I irrationally was not (laughs) a Parrish Cox fan in 2016. Oh, me, oh, my. It's it's funny, though, because sports make you do that. Like, there's so many people that will walk up to you and be like, man, I didn't like you in this game. It's like, why? I just had one bad game. Like, sports control your emotional strings so bad. And honestly, as a player, I never took it personal. Now, when you're asking somebody to die or, hey, yeah. you oh, suck, yeah, no, or I hope your your career injured, I mean, it's, it's over. and so That's a different that's game to be played. When it comes down to saying, okay, I didn't like this player because of his play, I can live that life. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, I know a lot of – a lot of Cincinnati Bengals fans and and cousin Danny from the borough. You let me know if I'm wrong on this one, okay? But some absolutely loved Vontae's perfect, and some absolutely hated him, even as their own fan. I'd love to hear Danny's take on him because I was told by his teammates, the greatest, one of the best teammates you could have. Really, you love him. He's in your foxhole with you, like you want to battle with him. But well, it was so bad one time on the field with them. Well, he was on one of those tangents, just personal file, extra stuff after the play. And the game is already so physical between us and them, between us and Cincinnati, 
that you find yourself just like, well, whoever makes a mistake is going to lose. And it always be him pushing and getting that, like an extra 10 yards or something. Like even his teammates was just like, bro, Burfick is on that bull. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they, he just make the game worse because then we get mad and they get mad. Like, and you playing th- with emotions, you know what I'm saying? And instead of just playing the game for execution. Right. And he used to just, you ever see somebody come to a party and be like, oh, God, here come George again. <laughs> like, that was him on game day. So most people felt about me. Uh... <laughs> Fight's going to break out. Yeah. 615-737-1045 is our number. Let's go to Celeste in Hendersonville first up. What's up, Celeste? Hello. How are y'all? Great. Good, Good morning. Well, I'm answering the question about least favorite player on your favorite team. All right. My favorite team is uh, New Orleans Saints. has been for 45 years. And I do not like their car. I wish they'd get rid of that man. And bring somebody in there that can help us get back where we were. It's a solid answer. It's fair. Thank you, Celeste. It was crazy. It's only been one year for Carr. I know. One year know. of disappointment. <laughs> it's one year of pain. <laughs> one year too long. Yeah. Well, honestly, if I had the most likable backup quarterback in the league and maybe the history of life in Jameis Winston as well, I would also not like my starter. Yeah. I would want King Jameis to be starting. I feel like Saints fans are spoiled, though. Like, you were dating J-Lo with Drew Brees. Like, now you can't be upset when you're dating just, like, a little knockdown. Like, you had a Hall of Famer. You can't be upset at the next guy for not also being a Hall of Famer. You're out of your J-Lo era. You can't, you can't get a guy like that again. Like Colts fans <laughs> booing Andrew Luck Jeez. after he retired. Uh, Bert, what's your answer on this, by the way? Uh, I, could go, I feel like I'm going to have to go the cop-out answer, but I will give you – I feel like every person has a cornerback and a – kicker on their team that they hate i would mm. say bernard pollard but he knocked out stephen ridley in that playoff Titans game legend, man. so I've, I've got to give him a pass i think i'm gonna have to go with billy cundiff for missing that kick they okay. probably could have went to two super bowls if he would have just just make a field goal dude just do your job but i can't be too mad because be, him failing to make that kick is the reason they have justin tucker right so you live Golly. with the you live with the bruises Some, okay. somebody said jeff swain for the Titans. Jeff Swain, really? That's a good pick. What, did, what did Jeff do? Well, yeah, was trotted out there too much yeah. as a receiver. It's almost not his fault. <laughs> yeah. Right? He's, he was trotted out there as a receiver. Yeah, well, he was. Jeez. Maybe that's facts. You know, I thought somebody was going to say Pac, but Pac was only here for two years. I heard 3HL talking about him yesterday. Only here for two years at that. Yeah. Well, let's go to Elliot in Kentucky then on the phone lines. Who's up next? What's up, Elliot? Hey, what's up, guys? What's up? Uh, yeah, I was definitely going to say Pat. Oh, uh, my oh. bad. I ain't mean to steal your thunder. No, you can steal it all you want. That guy, it's not because of his play. It's because of his character. Uh, I remember I met the guy one time. I was I was heading into basic, and I was at a hotel. And I was in the elevator, and he's with a couple guys. And he's, he's telling me, oh, you, you got to resort to the Army. I was like, yeah, this guy's a joke. Um so, yeah, yeah, my, my answer there is Pac-Man Jones. I've been watching Titans forever. Love listening to y'all. I'm going to hang up. Appreciate wow. That. Thanks, Elliot. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a big thing. Yeah, I've, I've heard he rubbed a whole lot of people the wrong way in this city. Sure did. I've yeah. heard some stories. Yeah. I'm glad he's gotten his life back together and is on a, a good path now, but not to rehash too much of the past with him. But yeah, it was in this town. I heard. Things were were. Different. Yeah. Our old producer, um, Justice, always would say, if you really wanted to see the phones light up at any given moment back then, you just mentioned Pac-Man and, like, wildfire. You'd have five callers just ready to go. Good for radio. He was only here for two years. Oh, yeah. And it was like, golly, he must have went on a tear. Was Nashville then, like, a big town still? No. No. It was a big city. Okay. And for the circles we run in, in a lot of ways, it still isn't. Yeah. Um, That's true. Mm Mm-hmm. But no, it was we, we were still a, a town and not a city at that point okay. in Nashville. You, you know who else I thought would have or should have made it because of the same issues would probably have been VY, Vince Young. Vince was he pump faked a bit know. more of an interesting case because he was so fun those first couple of years. And when he got replaced, we were still good. Like Kerry Collins led the Titans to the number one overall seed. So it's not like... Titans fans didn't like Vince. It was like, oh, but we're better off. So you immediately had something better going on that you didn't really hold it against Vince all that much. It was just kind of like a Vince. Vince can't help Vince. Vince was his own worst enemy Yeah. at that point. 
And but it, it was so much fun here. Like he's on the cover, Madden, and you know the the drive to beat the Cardinals in the last minute, and the the run in Houston in overtime to beat them on a walk off. And he's a Texas guy, and I mean th- there are a lot of good memories with Vince too. And like it, I, that was my first. Well, that was my second Titans jersey I ever had after Steve. Oh man, was a Vince Young jersey. And the lead up to get Vince too was very interesting. Yeah, also, like right. you you somewhat knew that he would be here. But, of course, the excitement of him coming off the national championship yeah. and everything that came with him. We like, were excited. Yeah. He was so good in college. That's oh. what I'm saying. And, and just freestyle the entire thing, at least is what he said or it was uh, said about him in those moments. Ben on Twitter writes in uh, at Ramon Kayla Will where you can submit your least favorite player who's ever played for one of your teams and says, does Todd Downing count? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point Woof. we honestly should have expanded this to coaches as well or yeah. gms yeah, yeah the J. Uh, john is not strike. even close to the top of my I've list i've seen some people in the oh, chat no. yeah. that's ridiculous oh, it's absolutely ridiculous if john robinson is somebody's least favorite for the titans there have been far worse far worse does, does Vrabel make somebody short list now no he does not i don't think so okay okay i, I wasn't sure did. I wasn't sure. If Unless you just don't list. like him, the person, and you just have it out for him. It, it seems like after he was let go and the new coaches came in, you somewhat heard a little bit more of like, yeah, it was time to move on from him and all those types of conversations. That's yeah. just fascinating to me. And some more little inter- intel I've heard in the past week or so is that when Vrabel coached, you were kind of walking on eggshells is, eggshells. is the word. Yeah. Oof. So it was interesting, the NFL PA yeah. survey that came out and said that most players liked him and thought they were he was efficient with their time. Right, and that's the thing. Like they felt like they were walking on eggshells, but a lot of guys still respected him. Yeah, you know, if you were one of his guys, maybe I ain't sure, but uh, that'd be fascinating to see how, in hindsight, in the next couple of years, how that turns out. So, where does Russell Wilson end up before we move on and take more calls? I I said Atlanta last week when we had this discussion. I, I don't but know. I don't think he's going to. I don't know if there's a place for Russ right right now. Russ gonna have to go through a free agency. I think of maybe not being signed. You look at the teams that need quarterbacks. They got options to go get a younger, cheaper one. Like unless Russ is about right. to take a one for five, that's his biggest issue. Is what is he also going to want to be paid? Minnesota got an option to go get a quarterback that's younger. Uh, Atlanta got Justin Fields on call if they need him to. Uh, Patriots don't re- really need him if they don't have to have him. If they want to go get Jaden Daniels or something like that, he's up against the wall. Could a team pair Jaden Daniels with Russell Wilson? Have a long-term and short-term option? I like the idea. Not a bad idea. idea. ESPN.com uh, hypothesized that the Raiders could do that. Huh. That's interesting. Pair Antonio Pierce with Jaden Daniels. They were together at Arizona State. And then go get Russell Wilson in the meantime. Mm. Russell in Vegas. 615-737-1045 is our number. Who is your least favorite player? Let's make it person. Why not throw offensive coordinators in there? Least favorite person from your favorite team. We'll talk about more of that next.
Wrap it up, hour number one on your Tuesday morning edition of RKW. Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by Eighth and Roast. Coming up in 15 minutes on the NFL franchise tag deadline day. The Chiefs make their move yesterday, as expected. Talk about that. Hit the other headlines as Jason Kelsey announces his retirement as well. But the question we asked before the break, it's got the people going this morning and letting the hate flow through them before 7 a.m. on a beautiful Tuesday in Nashville. Who's the least favorite person to ever represent one of your favorite teams? Let's go to Braden and Shelbyville, who is up next. Let's go ahead, Braden. Good morning, guys. How y'all doing? Great. Hello, good morning. Good morning, morning. So uh, this player kind of redeemed himself, but he got burnt so much and so often for the Tennessee Vols. Me and my dad started calling him toast. And after every play, he would always run his mouth after giving up 50 yards. But he picked off Spencer Rattler for a pick six, and he redeemed himself. His name was Kamal Hatton. That's yeah. good. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God. I see him on the TV, and it would infuriate me. How do you get he call smack after giving up 55 yards? And he'd be saying, why didn't you give up 56? Oh, <laughs> he, he redeemed himself, so all was good, and that's all I got for this morning. Thank you, Braden. Appreciate the call. I think that's a lot of Vols fans' answers before this past fall. It was Kamal Haddon, who's now going to be a pro. Yeah. yeah. He's going to get drafted. I'm talking about mid-round guy. I had one of my former teammates who's an agent that was looking to sign him. Crazy. Like, he's like, yeah, he's going to be all right. Mm-hmm. Corey in Hendersonville next up. What's up, Corey? What's up, Will? So, fellow Braves fan here, mm-hmm. and uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this answer. Uh, hopefully you remember this player. Uh, think back to the 2005 season for me, Will. Uh, do you remember Joey Devine? Joey Devine, yep. Uh, first player in MLB history to give up two grand slams in his first two outings <laughs> as a pitcher. And Bobby Cox still allowed this man to pitch in the postseason with only five innings under his belt, and he gives up a walk-off home run in the bottom of the 18th inning <laughs> of the right. 2005 NLDS, and subsequently Atlanta misses the playoffs several years after that. Last time that he would ever pitch as a Brave. Oh, yes. VFL Chris Burke and those Houston Astros. Thank you for the call, Corey. <laughs> Back when Houston was in the NL. that eight, I remember watching that 18-inning game, too. Oh, that's a good pick. I, I was just telling them in the break, there are a lot of baseball players that are good picks yeah. on this. Yeah. Uh, like Will Smith, the Braves closer for a little bit there, was a good pick. And then he won the World Series. And then last year, he won another World Series. So he's now won two straight World Series on two different teams. We had Alex Rodriguez, so that's mine. A Rod was a stud with the Mariners. Though. Yeah, but I loved A Rod, especially on uh, King Griffey Jr. Baseball. A Rod's still A Rod, though. It, it, what, was know. he a bad human out there? Well, he's just, just no, not a bad human, but the attitude. I don't know something about A Rod. Was a child Loves prodigy. Rod. I'm, I was an A Rod fan, and especially with the Mariners, I absolutely. Yeah, he loved did good him. stuff for him. Yeah. Let's go to Tyler in Murfreesboro next up. What's up, Tyler? Hey, what's up, guys? Good morning to y'all. How are y'all? Good. Good morning. Good. Um, so I know I'm not going to get any love for this, but I'm an Alabama fan, and uh, my person is actually two people. It's the last two offensive coordinators that we've had that have wasted incredible rosters and made Nick Saban retire because he hates offensive coordinators now. <laughs> it's Bill not bad. Brian and, and Tommy Reese. Yeah. Some of the earth people. Oh, man. Uh, that's a little harsh on Tommy <laughs> Reese, I think. Scum of the earth. You but thank you, question. Tyler. No, <laughs> it's 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 not my truth to tell. It's yours. <laughs> it's your truth to tell. I, I don't blame you on the Bill O'Brien one, though. Ugh. That one, I, I would hate him, too, if I was a man. Is he at Boston College now? That's well, right. Yeah, because Ohio BC. State had hired him. I'm like, they dodged oh, a bullet. Did. Got got Chip checked. Kelly and stuff. He wasn't a bat. I don't know. He, you loved him because. Yuck. Because we beat him. Yuck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Keep them. He can move on with that chin. Yeah, he can. Adam in Lebanon next up. What's up, Adam? So uh, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. Okay. And when you mentioned players, I was going through 40 or 50 years of players because that's how long I've been supporting them. And then when you turned it into anyone in the organization, that's all I needed to hear. Uh-oh. Jerry Jones. <laughs> man cannot get out of his own way. Yep. No, Jerry my, Jones facts. might be my daddy, y'all. Uh, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta fight with with Bird on that one. Jerry Jones. Yeah. I always think it's interesting the way Cowboys fans view him because 
he did create what is the biggest business in sports. Yet now, at the end of it, it's not great. It's not great at all. And it's also the the uh, wild goose chase that he has as, as trying to win, like, a certain way and certain coaches and certain players. Like, he sold out a lot. Uh, Brad writes in, at Ramon Kayla Will, he says Parrish Cox as well. See, I'm telling you. You say Parrish Cox to people who were Titans fans in 2016. Ugh. I wanted to go look at this PFF grade. They ain't even got him. I know. I did the exact same thing. I actually found that I found a uh, I found an article from Sam Monson in 2016 writing 10 worst players in the NFL this week. And that Oof. was where I found the stat of Andrew Luck targeting him six times for over 150 yards in one game. This dude's a Super Bowl champ. Let's go to Eric in Nashville to wrap up our conversation on least favorite players on your team here in hour one. Go ahead, Eric. Hey, guys, I'm going to miss for me James Harden of the Sixers because he destroyed that team last year. But for the Titans, you, you, we've had some horrible free agent signs. <laughs> you know, Jadavia and Cloudy. Mm. But the one, and I got to give Robert Walsh credit for this. I said, who's the latter fucking player that came here to screw this team? And it was Vic Beasley. Yeah, oh, yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah yep. what he did to this team. I mean, it was horrendous. But y'all start talking about this. He's definitely number one for me. Guys, y'all take care of what's up. Thank you, Eric. Never found a guy that wow. was that least passionate about football that heard. plays football. That's what I heard. That's crazy. And he's still playing in like the USFL or some, whatever it is now. I wouldn't even have no desire to play. 615-737-1045 is our number. Coming up, more headlines around the league where a first ballot Hall of Famer is hanging it up. And the Chiefs position themselves for the franchise tag deadline today. Next on RKW. Guys, it's a new year, and Low T Center can make it a great one. If you've been feeling tired, grumpy, have noticed a lack of motivation and drive, have weight gain and loss of muscle mass, these could all be signs of low, testo- t- low testosterone levels. At Low T Center, they make it easy to get your levels checked. It's just a simple blood test with their on-site lab. You'll get your results back in about 25 minutes, too. That's really fast. Low T Center is not your typical doctor's office either. It's a concierge medicine for medicine. These physicians specialize in treating low testosterone and have been exclusively treating the men for years with most health insurance accepted. And they have affordable and convenient treatment options, including physicians monitored self-inject treatments that ship directly to your home each month. So there's no need to drive to the center for weekly visits. Right now, Low T Center is only $25 to get your, lo- the, your T levels tested. Make your health and quality of life a priority and make it a great year. Go to LowTCenter.com to book your appointment online today. That's LowTCenter.com. Low T Center, reinventing men's health care.
702. Good morning from the 1045 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Less than a week away from free agencies, legal tampering period, and teams are getting ready to make a big splash or solidifying one of the worst trades in NFL history as the Denver Broncos officially released quarterback Russell Wilson yesterday, just two years after trading for him. Releasing Wilson leaves an $85 million dead cap charge, the most in NFL history. For context, that's more than the last two dead cap charges combined. Now the 35-year-old Super Bowl MVP is free to sign wherever he would like to ride. 3 p.m. today is the deadline for players to be franchise tagged. A couple players that could get tagged if a long-term deal is not agreed upon. Colts wide receiver Michael Pittman, Jags outside linebacker Josh Allen, and Ravens defensive lineman Justin Matabike are all expected to be retained, new deal or not. And a trade in the NFL yesterday as the Bills send offensive lineman Ryan Bates to the Chicago. The Bears, the Bears had previously tried to sign Bates to an offer sheet, but Buffalo matched. Now the Bears send a fifth-round pick in this year's draft to secure the versatile offensive lineman. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Seven a.m. in the Music City as we roll into our number two of Ramon, Kayla, and Will RKW. We're brewed up by Eighth and Roast, where you can join us at six one five seven three seven one zero four five. Streaming live on one zero four five The Zone TV, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch please. In the FNM Bank chat, there commenting with us. It is wide open and ready for your thoughts. On who your least favorite player is to ever play for one of your favorite teams. At Ramon Kayla Will, where you can chime in on Twitter. Patrick says Kerry Collins. Oh. I don't know about that one. Huh. I don't know why we would be disliking Kerry Collins. Caught a stray. Hey. Had a good little season there. Took Titans to a one seed. I don't know. I don't have any ill will towards Kerry Collins. I got no ill will towards him. Okay, all right. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh, I'm Will Bowling. Jason Kelsey officially announces his retirement yesterday from the NFL. A sixth-round pick in 2011, played his entire 13-year career with the Eagles, and since the merger in 1970, he is the only center who has won a Super Bowl and earned first-team All-Pro honors six times. Dang is Jason Kelsey a first ballot Hall of Famer? He should yes. be. For an interior lineman, they need to open up the gates, okay? Stop gatekeeping for tackles and DNs and quarterbacks and wide receivers. Interior offensive linemen need to be celebrated, and it shouldn't take six all pros to do it either. Kelsey is a monster at it and has been really good, and he's not the only one. There's others that played before and are playing now that should be in that same consideration. They got to stop gatekeeping the uh, interior offensive line when it comes down to the NFL Hall of Fame. That's Yes, he should be first ballot. What an incredible career for a six-rounder, right? Yep. That Jeff Stoutland, the O-line coach at Philly, said, what if we made you into a center? And said it's the the thing that changed his life. Clearly. Definitely. Um, But to be able to do it as long as he did, just that well, Mm -hmm. consistently, consistently, excuse me, you're right, Ramon. It's hard to get the stats, especially as an interior offensive lineman. But for a guy like him, like the proof is in the pudding. Like put him in. Uh, absolutely, he, he'll definitely. I think he'll definitely get it though. But um, also his his size six three two ninety five. Yeah, centers don't have to be thick body guys. They just have to be efficient. And here's the other thing too. Probably got a little bit of a wrestling background. I know Bert uh, likes the Zach Frazier kid out of uh, West Virginia. Um, with that being said. Um, he u- utilized his skill set very, very well. Angles, uh, leverage, uh, speed was a part of his game, too. Um, and he's just one of the best to do it, man. I tip my hat to a guy that had the type of career that he had as a, as a late-round guy. Um, very, very happy to run into that dude whenever we cross paths. My only issue is, what's he going to say when he does go in the Hall of Fame? 
because he gave a 40-minute speech yesterday talking about his wife like she was dead. I, I, I'm sorry. I can't listen to stuff like that when it, we're just – well, it's like he was trying to renew his vows or something up there. And, and the funny thing is he was talking about his wife saying, I remember the night we met, when famously on his podcast she threw him under the bus for being blackout that night. That's correct. You don't remember anything from that night. She floated in with an aura around her. We're, we're just trying to pull crocodile tears out of Disney movies now. What are we doing? The dude sat up there for 40 minutes and chug lugged his way through that. Don't put him in the Hall of Fame. He gave his speech last night. I, I, to, to be fair, okay, those are the same things I said about Keisha, okay? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, well, uh, you were blackout <laughs> drunk when you met Keisha? No, I was not. I bought her a drink, though, in college is what happened, there you go. man. Uh, uh, but what had happened was I saw her on Facebook. Oh. It was what it was, I was like, that's going to be my girlfriend right there. And that's what it turned into. Okay. Your shot. Just going to th- Hey, look, Bert, us thick boys got to know how to have some game, man. You feel what I'm saying? I, I get all the pillow talk, man. You got to <laughs> say what you got to say. But you cannot tell me. I, I Genuinely, I do not believe in this. The first time you saw her, before she, you ever said a word, yeah. that's going to be my wife. There's no way. I, I find I generally. Promise. He's my, questioning I you. I promise you. Uh, I prom- when Inky come on here, you can ask Inky. You I'll, can ask Rob. Or you can ask Mayo. I'm telling you, that happened. I'm, well, I'm glad that got to happen in your life. I'm glad somebody loved you enough to go ahead and say, yeah, I think I want to settle down. Good for you, man. Maybe I'm just bitter back here. <laughs> we, we, you got to get that mullet. Mm, that's what it is. You got to get that mullet. Or Lamar's got to win a Super Bowl. So he, he was he, <laughs> he was he was oh you stupid. If y'all don't know, Bert's Bert's contract with his lady is she'll get a ring when Lamar Jackson gets one. <laughs> this is so ridiculous. <laughs> she so hates ridiculous. that too. By the way, she's like, "Why are you always talking dirty about me on the air?" Did she go back and listen? <laughs> no, she. Yeah, there are little rats around town that run a scurry on over to where she works at and holler at her and about told it. her. Hey, with that being said, though, Bert, what he's basically doing is recommitting himself to his family in that press conference, I think, by saying, y'all stuck with me for 13 years throughout this thing. Now I'm yours again. Well, when you put it like that, now I sound like a jerk. Hey. <laughs> That's my, that was my intention. <laughs> Yesterday, the Chiefs officially placed the non-exclusive tag on Legereus Sneed and the deadline for teams to use the franchise tag on pending free agents is today at 3 p.m. Central. Non-exclusive tag allows Legereus need to talk to other teams who then could work out a trade with the Chiefs. And ESPN's Jeremy Fowler writes that the Chiefs had informed Sneed they were preparing to place the tag on him and were open to finding a trade. So if he were to play on the franchise tag in the 2024 season, his salary would be $19.8 million fully guaranteed. That would not bode super well for Chris Jones coming back if Legereus Sneed does play on a $19.8 million cap charge. That is actually such a smart move by uh, the, the uh, Chiefs, though, too, because the thing is you love to have him. It'd be good to have him, and he's yours. Right. But I'm, I'm, instead of us working for your trade, us trying to find you a destination, I'm putting it in you and your right. agent's court. Y'all, Hey, y'all go find a trade and bring us your best offer. Like, I think that's smart on their behalf is go get us a second rounder if you want to. We'll let you go. But we also have your rights if we have to. And it looks like it's closer to figuring something out with Chris Jones than it would with Snead coming back at I this point. What his numbers but gonna be. It's going to be big. It's going to be crazy. Elsewhere in the NFL, you've got ESPN's Jeremy Fowler writing that the Chiefs or Titans could be in play for Bears wide receiver Darnell Mooney. Begs the question that we'll get into more coming up here in a few minutes on. Which current Titans receiver has a bigger role in the 2024 Titans offense? Traylon Burks or Kyle Phillips that we can get into in a little bit coming up. But Darnell Mooney, estimate from Spot Track to get a $10.4 million AAV, four years, $41.9 million for the 26-year-old wide receiver. Are you in or out? Ah, at this point, you need as much help as you possibly can. I'm in. That's a value pick for a doggone wide receiver. Um, has shown some signs of, of being a, a good player. Um, over 1,000 yards, if I'm not mistaken, in his second year. A dude that seems to understand that, hey, this is my shot to become a guy somewhere else. And considering what Chicago has been offensively for the last few years, I mean, I'm surprised he's at this level of protection for this team. And it also, to me, shows this also. 
um, there are going to be multiple ways in order how they build this team up. And, like, this is the second time the Titans have been linked to a wide receiver free agency. Mike Evans yesterday, yep. and now we got Darnell Mooney is another guy. That lets us know, I think, what their outlook is as far as the draft and their targets. We'll dive deeper into that. We'll also take a look at a new athletic mock draft that has the Titans trading out of number seven. Would you take a trade out of seven for the price that Dame Brugler and the athletic write this morning? We'll dive into that next on RKW.
Tuesday morning on our mode, Kayla and Will RKW is brewed by 8th and Roast as we talk some Titans with you. Dane Brugler and The Athletic have a mock draft that has the Titans moving back out of number seven, trading with the Minnesota Vikings, and we get our first look at what national reporters think the number seven overall pick is worth. We'll get to that coming up in just a moment. 615-737-1045 is our number. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling with you. Guys, as the Titans look to address the wide receiver position this off season. Who has a bigger role in 2024? Traylon Burks or Kyle Phillips? What's the bigger need? A slot receiver or an outside receiver? I'm going Traylon Burks. Has the bigger role? Has a bigger role. Okay. Has to. You got the first round tag still. I think the the idea that he's with D Hop right now buys him more in the emotional data banks of Rand, of Brian Callahan of his wide receivers coach. Uh, the idea that he is, in the last two years, to be fair, for Traylon Burks. And I, I heard Rondam talking about him yesterday, and Mayer is somewhat out on him. I was like, give me something. And I'm just like, it, he last year he came prepared, for the most part. The injury happened in Minnesota, um, right? And you have that happen, then he gets out of shape probably because he can't run on the knee. Then he gets back and have a good game, and then he end up having a concussion. It's not like Traylon's not trying. And his injuries ain't even like, knock on wood for him, ACL. It's not anything crazy. It's not anything ligament. Like, these are like bones. This is like uh, a con- bad concussion situation that he's had. He was prepared last year. Um, and this year he's taking that, that that same attempt again by working out with D-Hop and becoming a better wide receiver. Maybe he's working on his skills and not just trying to get in shape this year. I think that's probably been his biggest hiccup. And, again, for me, um, it's a three-year ride. This year is the year that he has to take – I'm talking about at least get in the front seat, call shotgun, and and ride in the front seat and start talking and looking down the street and, and, and t- hey, turn right here. Hey, turn – like, tell him, I'm open. This is the year he does that, which is why I'm saying, Traylon, this is your year to shine. Yeah. That's he, where I'm at. He and has I'm probably to. giving too much grace. I know a yeah. lot of people ain't on the Traylon train. They've already punched their ticket to drive their car instead of ride that train. He has to do something this year. If he does not take a step in the right direction, if he is not available consistently, if he does not put some numbers up there, it's like I think he's done here. Like he has to do something this year. I think he has a chance to. And you're right about the injuries. They're not soft tissue. So maybe it takes a Tyke Tolbert coming in as a wide receivers coach. Maybe it takes a new offensive mind, Brian Callahan, to make sure you're getting the most out of Traylon Burks. Um, that confidence that he's lacked at moments because he's not on the field and he's not able to string together anything. He's got to find that as well. And so I'm not completely out. I'll give him one more year, but I don't want to see always oh, back at training camp and he looks good. I want to see that in the season because – He's a first-rounder. That's what they took him as. You got to be able to prove that at some point, or you're out. I feel like Kyle Phillips' familiarity and chemistry with Will Levis is not talked about enough. Kyle Phillips against Pittsburgh had five catches for 68 yards against Tampa, five for 61, and maybe just because he was the only guy who could get open over the middle of the field in tight spaces at the slot. But I feel like Brian Callahan has a bigger role for Kyle Phillips than Mike Vrabel did, and I don't think it's close. And Kyle Phillips has to stay healthy. But I think there is a scenario where the Titans ask Traylon Burks to do very little and do one thing really well. Run the in-breaking routes really well and run with the football in your hand and break some tackles. But ultimately, I think the profile of receiver the Titans are looking for is they're looking for another physical outside receiver who can actually win down the field. And that's why, to me, I don't trust Traylon Burks to catch the ball when it's thrown to him 30, 40-plus yards down the field. I think Kyle Phillips is more of a safety blanket for Will Levis that I can trust if he can stay healthy, and that's a big if, but we're saying the same if about Traylon Burks as well. I would probably still lean Traylon, but I'm 50-50 on it. Okay. To be honest with you. I think it could go either direction, and I think it's 
simply down to what is the value of guys who play those same roles that are available in the draft or free agency? What do you feel like the Titans are more likely to add? A Lad McConkey type slot receiver, a Darnell Mooney, or an outside guy, obviously not Mike Evans because he's no longer available, but with the Titans' reported interest in Mike Evans, are they more likely to chase a 20 to $25 million outside wide receiver to be a number 1A or 1B with DeAndre Hopkins? Um, I think they're going to find one of free agency if they can. I don't think for that expensive. Slot or outside? Outside. Yeah. Outside, just because D Hop worked well, I thought last year was playing the slot where he was. He broke down defenses, played it across the middle. Um, he does still have that down the field speed. We saw last year him making some of his sideline catches and whatnot, but it may be suited now to move him better inside so that he can get more catches, break the defense down a little bit more. I see a role for him that can be carved out as far as him extending chains and knowing how to get down. That's one thing about D-Hop and watching him. He's a guy that will get down quickly, get his yards and get down. And I think that's why he can be better served in the slot. You go outside for a dude, um, and, and you can get him at a value at about 8 to $12 million a year at wide receiver. I lived that life on top of having trailing also. Yeah, I thought it was interesting about the Mike Evans report that the Titans were somewhat interested that makes me think maybe they do lean that way in free agency just because you can't guarantee that Traylon is going to give you that this year. You you hope Traylon can take that step, but at the same time, if there's someone who's proven that can do it, why not go get that? In the draft, maybe you address more of that slot receiver position, maybe the speed you're looking for because we all know that there's going to be some speed in this draft when it comes to the wide receivers so my bet is more so that. So Dame Brugler and the Athletic have a mock draft out now that just came out this morning that has the Titans trading out of pick number seven. So in the lead up to that, let's tell you who's on the board first before you determine whether or not you would make this decision for the Titans. Caleb Williams, of course, going one to Chicago. Drake May going two to Washington. It feels like those two picks are becoming set in stone. At this point, number three, Dame Brugler, the athletic have the Atlanta Falcons trading with the new England Patriots for the third overall pick and selecting LSU quarterback, Jaden Daniels in that trade. The Falcons would send picks eight 43 and a 2025 first to the Patriots for number three. After that, the Cardinals take Marvin Harrison jr. At four, the Chicago bears trade with the Los Angeles chargers at number five, and add Roma Dunze out of Washington to Caleb Williams' arsenal, sending picks 975 and a 2025 fourth to the Chargers for number five. Then the New York Giants take Malik Neighbors at number six. So Joe Alt in this scenario is sitting right there for the Titans at number seven. And Dane Brugger and the Athletic have the Titans trading with the Minnesota Vikings allowing the Vikings to select J.J. McCarthy, the Michigan quarterback. Would you accept this trade? Number 11, number 109, and a 2025 second-round pick for number 7. Once again, that is number 11, the Vikings' first-round pick this year, number 109, and number 2 for them in 2025 for the seventh overall pick. Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. Doing. I'm out. I'm you're you're out. I'm out. Why? Joe Alt. If Joe just... Alt is sitting right there, you would have to give Oof. me a one, a two, and a three this year for me to do that trade. If you're getting a quarterback, the price is going to be higher. You can ask mm-hmm. that, but they don't not they're not going to give it. We That's saw fine. a similar trade last year, right? When it comes down to it, and then of course the pick that they have you taken is a, is still a solid prospect as it pertains to getting CJ Lake. So there is precedent for the seventh overall pick being flipped for the, for a team's top three picks. When Buffalo moved up to take Josh Allen Mm -hmm. at number seven in 2018, they got 12 or the Tampa Bay, excuse me, uh, was at 12. So Tampa Bay and, and Buffalo swapped from seven to 12. Tampa Bay got 12, 53 and 56. They actually got two seconds and number 12 overall. For Josh Allen at number seven and 255. 
you've got to give me your top three picks if you are taking a quarterback. And that is why the deal with the Lions and the Cardinals last year when the Cardinals moved up to take Paris Johnson, it's one thing if you're moving up to six to take a tackle. But if you're moving up to take your franchise quarterback, you got to pay for it. That's fair. It's going to cost you. I'll give you that, but they're also giving you that 25 second rounder too. So you also you get a, a, another high pick. Right. So the three picks that you're asking for, you still get those top three picks. And with the team that needs immediate needs for a first time head coach, a new head coach for this city, getting that number, staying in that top 15 at number 11, that 109 pick, and also being able to get your guy still at tackle. If you need, if that's where you want to go with a guy like J.C. Latham, you still have that ability. I am all in on the Joe Alt conversation. I really am. But if they want to move up and give us more capital, that's still a good premium. Picking at number 11 ain't a bad place to be at considering the type of guys that are still there. Still on that board, too, is the pick after is the Brock Bowers if you wanted to go that route. So there are still plenty of options if it's not going to be a J.C. Latham. Again, for a guy like him, um, it's, it's, it's necessary um, to understand what's inside of that room again is to build Callahan effect. And my thing is, you still got a cornerback in Koyan Mitchells that's still on the board. There's a lot of premium players that are still there from what we've seen post combine to me, too. I, I've, me personally, I've been on the board of move back. I know you want just one more higher pick. You want another one, is what you're saying. The two twos is what you're asking for. No, I want one, two, and three. You want See, one, and that's two, the thing. If now, if it was a three, like that dead would be sold for me. But because it's a four, now I'm kind of like, ah, is that really worth it? There's still talent, but no. three is such a, a big, I just feel like that round is where you get some real value in the draft. Really? And they still have it empty. In this scenario as well, the Titans would end up with J.C. Latham at number 11. Hmm. So they've got a run on tackles after the Vikings would take J.J. McCarthy at seven. In this scenario, Joe Alt goes eighth to the Patriots. Tale Fuaga goes ninth to the Chargers. Olu Fashanu goes 10th to the Jets. And J.C. Latham in this scenario goes 11th to the Titans. So you move back four spots, and instead of getting the number one tackle, you get the number four tackle. Yeah. But for some people, J.C. Latham is the number one tackle. I think it was Lance Zerline I was reading last night on NFL.com. Has J.C. Latham as his number one tackle in the draft. He had another... Um... He had another mock draft today, too, if I'm not mistaken. Zerline did. He yeah, just everybody did their their 2.0 today, and we'll get into ESPN's two-round one here in a second. Yeah. Um, I'll see if I can effort Zerline's real quick since he liked them so much. He still has the Titans at number seven taking alt. While Ramon's looking at that, does it change your opinion if you didn't know what they were trading up for? Because they're not going to tell you what they're trading up for. Like in uh, in the 2016 draft, I know the Ravens were trying to move from six to four, but were unable to. But they were trying to move up for Jalen Ramsey, but the Cowboys would not trade them because they thought they were lying and they were coming up for Ezekiel Elliott. Ooh. So if, if they don't tell you what they're trading up for, does it change your opinion on those picks? I, I mean, I think it's obvious. If you move up, though, if you're Minnesota, Atlanta, or Vegas trying to go to seven, you know, you know it's J.J. McCarthy. But if one yeah. of the, say one of those teams signed, like we were talking about earlier, a short-term, and they're drafting their long-term. So say Minnesota brings back Kirk Cousins, and they're like, hey, we want to come up for mm. – uh, we're coming up for Roma Dunze. We're definitely not coming up for a quarterback. Does that change your opinion on those picks? It doesn't for me. No. Because I think there's a scenario where one of those teams brings in a stopgap veteran quarterback and still, still drafts, drafts J.J. McCarthy yeah. at seven. I'd take their picks. But that's just me. I take the pick. So again, it's 11, 109, and a 20, 25 second. That's right after three. 109 is, right? Yeah, it is. It's like fourth round, technically. It's not a highway in Lebanon. Wilson County. 109. 109. Yeah, it is. It's actually the back wagon. Uh, I was going to say, you told yeah, me. Highway 109. <laughs> Shout out to my Southern County people. Wilson County, too. Um, 11, 109, and a 25. One more. Yeah. I need you can three. fight for one more. If this is our baseline, you can give me one more. That's I need another I pick this year. Three. Yep. And so is Minnesota the, the dancing partner that the Titans would potentially have this year, too? I think Minnesota and Vegas are the two. 11 or 13. And at that point, you're still within the realm of getting a premier player and getting a player who has a certified first-round grade. Matt Miller of ESPN, who is uh, going to join us uh, tomorrow, actually, on the show. 
has said that there are 16 players with a first-round grade. So you're still within the realm of getting a first-round player. So here's the issue with doing business with uh, the Vikings. They have no third. They got two fourths, okay. two well, fifths, two sixths, and a seventh. That explains it. Go. That yeah. explains why yeah. they're being cheap. I'm saying that I'm throwing in a sixth and give me your other fourth. Okay. Which they're not going to do because that would take them totally out of the fourth round. And they don't have a third. Yeah, they don't have a third themselves. I would rather trade with Vegas. Yeah, at this me point. Me too. Heck yeah. <laughs> I'd rather trade with Vegas. Yeah, unless they're going to give up that 42. And granted, it, it's going to be a higher price for Vegas because then they're forcing you to move down more in the first round. And that yeah. is also why Minnesota, you could argue, doesn't have to offer you as much because they're only making you move down four spots. But but that also is at a point that you need this. And I got somebody else that's negotiating with me too. If you want a quarterback, you got to pay a premium. The Titans paid a premium for Will Levis, and he yeah. wasn't even a first-round pick. Sure in the heck did. And that's the reason we're in this spot right now. Exactly. You that three, four. Yeah. You love J.J. McCarthy? Show me. Make it worth my while because I'm good. I can take Joe Alt right here and be good on the left side of my line for a decade. Make it worth my while yeah. to take the fourth tackle instead of the first tackle. And still have enough money to go sign somebody in free agency too because of cap. Jordan Reed on ESPN.com in a two-round mock draft has Joe Alt at seven. And in the second round... I named him as one of my draft crushes yesterday after he was a thorn in my side as a Tennessee fan for what seemed like a decade. Ten-year Georgia veteran, Lad McConkey. <laughs> <laughs> At number 38, I am down. If you, could, if you told me today, hey, you can just skip the whole draft process. We'll give you Joe Alt in the first round, Lad McConkey in the second. Sold. Done. Where do I sign? Let's go. When does rookie minicamp start? Only qu- I love that. And I know the fact that we ain't include free agency in it. I, I can't wait to see what defensively you do for free agency, too. I agree. That's the There's other side. some holes. Because if that's the case, that's eight straight picks of offensive players. Yeah. Like, you gotta you got to mix in some defense and, somehow. And the thing is, they don't have to because there's a lot of pieces that have to be filled in offensively. But there is a need for the advancement of this defense. You don't want to be grinding that group to a pulp again. You know what I'm saying? Well, like, especially the secondary. Say, say what you say what you want to about Shane. Shane actually held it together as much as he possibly could until it was just they ran out of Cowboys to play in a movie. That's essentially what it turned into last year. Like, they be there, and you see the aggressiveness that he brings to them, and then he run out of gas. You know what I'm saying? And that's where that's very problematic right there, too. Yeah, it's interesting. Another uh, comment in the FNM Bank chat says the Jets could also go from 10 to 7. Jets, yeah. That would surprise me. Uh, for what position? Tackle? <laughs> the tackle you want? Yeah, every, I was going to say, I, that, would, that would surprise me because <laughs> so, you've got the same needs as the Jets. So if you're doing business with the Raiders, I'm not sure. Did we bring this up the other day? But you got uh, swapping 13. So you go to 13. They also have a second-round pick, 44, third-round 77, and a fourth mm-hmm. at 113. Yeah, I want 44, 77, and 13 if you're going to move up to seven. And I'll throw in one of those sevens from the Titans. Ooh, if yeah. you subscribe to the Jimmy Johnson trade value chart, the seventh overall pick holds four, or 1,500 points of value. Uh, a second-round pick holds about 500. So it, trade value-wise, a first and a second would get the job done based strictly off trade value. Added a first and a second, not a swap of a first and a second. Correct. Okay. So yeah. you got to give me a one and a two to justify it. Or give me two twos and a three? Uh, yeah, they one, need a th- one, two, and three, one, two, and three is all I need to do it. Okay. But that's more than what Dame Brugler and the Athletic are projecting here. Look at aggressive will over here, man. <laughs> no, I mean, it is. Like, look, if if you want to get go up and get your future at quarterback, I'm with you. pay for it. Just like the Bills did with Josh Allen when they swapped ones and gave up two twos, 53 and 56 for seven and 255. And again, that's what you'd probably end up doing. You've got a surplus of sevens, and this is not a draft at the back end where sevens mean a whole lot anyway. Throw in a seven if you got to do that and get it done. I'm Fine. With Throw in a six. I don't care. With that, to get it done, just to add the value, keep the value going up. Yep. Yeah, I'm here for it. 615-737-1045 is our number. You've heard of getting fired on your day off. What about getting fired on your birthday? That happened in the NFL yesterday, and nobody told the person who runs the Twitter. Incredible story. We'll tell you about next.
Hey, this is the time of year to enjoy life. Uh, stop letting that pain in your joints keep you from doing what you love to do this spring. Call QC Kinetics now. QC Kinetics is the nation's leader in regenerative medicine. And I'm talking about lasting joint pain relief. No surgery, no drugs, no downtime. In fact, QC Kinetics is literally transforming lives. Their advanced treatments harness your own body's ability to restore and repair that damaged joint tissue. So no pain pills, no risky surgery. This is an all natural solution. And they have tens and thousands of satisfied patients that are really reclaiming their lives back and their mobility. Take action now and live your best life this spring and summer. It's a great use also of your tax fund check. So, you know, call them now. Give QC Connects a call for a free consultation. 615-249-4024. Call QC Kinetics at 
RKW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Roast on 104.5 The Zone. Coming up in just about 15 minutes, Charles Davis joins the show. VFL, CBS Sports, NFL Network. Of course, you're on Football Saturday with Doug Matthews on the station every weekend as well. Looking forward to talking some NFL draft with him before Austin Price joins us for his weekly segment coming up at 8.30 this morning. But guys, yesterday was a tough day to be Jags defensive tackle Folarunso Fatukasi, who was told happy birthday on Twitter by the Jacksonville Jaguars and then was later released by the Jacksonville Jaguars yesterday afternoon. Uh, reportedly, the social media team had no idea the release was coming. It was still his birthday. Might want to check. <laughs> yeah. Might want to check. Sucks. To, to, to be fair, for his birthday to be on the Monday, did he celebrate the weekend so he really wasn't, you know, coherent with what was going on on Monday morning anyway? Or does he say, I ain't got no job, and I'm just going to go get blasted for my birthday <laughs> today since I got fired? I mean, he's still in his eye. Yeah. That's tough. Happy birthday. Thanks for saving us three and a half million against the cap. Jeez. If you're looking at the positive side, he's probably going to get double pay this year because I'm sure he had dead money. Then he gets re-signed. You make a little more money. So, I mean, if he's looking at the positive side, and he doesn't have to live in Jacksonville anymore. That's very true. (laughs) I I mean, when you start breaking (laughs) down like that, I don't realize how big of a ghost town Jacksonville is. Like, it's, it's just a massive city with nothing in the middle of it. Like, they got homes and stuff. Like, yeah. I, I tend to, like, when we go places, like, look at, like, the real estate in certain areas, nothing appealing there whatsoever. You know it's the largest city in the country. I, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That is wild. Largest city by area in the United States. Uh, I had a, a former uh, teammate that was from Jacksonville, or he played in Jacksonville also. And uh, he was just like, yeah, getting to the other side of town might take you, like, 45 minutes with no traffic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe that's why it, it's a ghost town, right? Because you don't want to drive to go to downtown and hang out or wherever the nightlife is where I don't think there's much of it um, because it's just so dang spread out. It, it is. Or they're just eventually will fill it in at some point. Yeah, but I guess. They also will never get another Super Bowl, too, because they had a huge debacle down there, too. The I, first time they I had still it. can't believe they had a Super Bowl. Then. They're redoing that whole stadium. Yeah. They are. Just like everybody else in the AFC South. Well, really, it's just... I guess Titans and Jags, but every stadium will be indoors. Oh, they're yeah. about to take it indoors in too. some capacity. Yeah, oh, wow, good for them, man. Um, they got questions soon that's got to be answered also with their quarterback and what they're going to do with him. I the can't night, wait to see. yeah, that's right. The nightlife in Jacksonville is just going to a jumbo shrimp game. Yeah, jumbo shrimp. That's the a Jacksonville good minor jumbo shrimp. Makes Makes sense. Sense. They're always the highest grossing merchandise team in minor league baseball. I'm not even sure it's close either because they, they, their J logo is a shrimp mm-hmm. for J for Jacksonville, and it's like a little shrimp on the hat. It's great. What, what about the, the biscuits thing? Yeah. Is that? Cause Montgomery I covered Biscuits them. is up there too. They're, uh, the, they have a, a tongue of butter it's a on, great, in the biscuit. It's a great symbol. Mm-hmm. The tongue of butter. It's so cute. Well, look He's up. like smiling, and the, the tongue of the biscuit is yeah. a little piece of butter. Okay. It's a good stadium too. Okay. Didn't really I know fun. that. Um, that sucks to get fired on your day off. I wanted to at least warn him, hey, we're about to cut you. Did he say, happy birthday, brother? Probably smart to warn the social media guy when you warn the player. Yeah. Social media messes up sometimes. Did, is it still up? Is, it, is the, the tweet I assume is still so. up? Oh, that's terrible. Well, he hit, he got an opportunity to hit free agency. He'd be all right. We asked earlier this morning for our question of the morning, who is your least favorite player or even just least favorite person to represent one of your favorite teams? Kevin in Nashville has been waiting to uh, chime in on this topic. What's up, Kevin? What's up, Kev? Hey, how y'all doing? Great. Hey, mine for the Washington Redskins, two of them. Try baby Drace, Jace Raider and the right and spoil owner, Dan Snyder. Mm, that's a good pick. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. We Dan appreciate Snyder the call. all the way. He said that was some hate Ooh. in his voice right there, too. I'm honestly surprised it took us this long to get a Dan Snyder answer. Yeah, for real. That dude, man, was a different animal. He's the type of guy that seems like he just got what he wanted out of life and said, watch me do what I want to now. I wonder if it annoys him at all. I know he has tons of money. Yeah. He's sitting there on a beach somewhere, but just because he is that type of guy, like, I'm not in football, I wonder if that bothers him at all. Ah. Uh. You know, it's big fraternity. I know that much. Yeah. Depends on if he still get invited to the Christmas parties. Wow. Uh, Joey on Twitter <laughs> writes in and says uh, he's a Steelers fan and says Chase Claypool. I can oh, see that I can see that one. Being I'm with you on that one. Uh, Garrett on Twitter says Jake Locker. 
Jake Locker? I don't know. Jake Locker was a nice enough guy. I don't why he catch a stray. I don't like him either. He was a Washington Husky. So uh, I'm with you, you on that one. Oh, with you have, on that one. I, I knew he'd against, be a bust. I have nothing oh, against Jake Locker. Bust. Man. Okay. B-U-S-T. Terrible. That's right. Jake Locker. Injury prone. Man. You could have known that coming out of college. Was he like that in college? Yeah, he just knew he wasn't going to be an NFL quarterback. Oh, okay. I'm serious. I, I didn't know Our much family about had conversations about this. It did. Uh, Very passionate about it. 615-737-1045 is our number. <laughs> Charles Davis of CBS Sports and NFL Network will join us just past the top of the hour for Austin Price of All Quest at 8.30. Ron Slay is still to come at 9.20. Halftime of the show already. It's RKW 104.5 The Zone.
Eight o'clock. Good morning from the 1045 The Zone Studios. I'm Robert Walsh. Less than a week away from free agency's legal tampering period, and teams are getting cap space ready in order to make a splash or solidifying one of the worst trades in NFL history as the Denver Broncos officially released quarterback Russell Wilson yesterday, just two years after trading for him. Releasing Wilson leaves an $85 million dead cap charge, the most in NFL history. For context, that's more than the last two highest dead cap charges combined. Now, the 35-year-old Super Bowl MVP is free to sign wherever he would like to ride. 3 p.m. today is the deadline to be for players to be franchise tagged. A couple players that could get tagged if a long-term deal is not agreed upon. Colts wide receiver Michael Pittman, Jags outside linebacker Josh Allen, and Ravens defensive lineman Justin Matabike. All are expected to be retained. New deal or not. And a trade in the NFL yesterday as the Bills send offensive lineman Ryan Bates to the Chicago Bears. Bears had previously tried to sign Bates to an offer sheet, but Buffalo matched last offseason. Now the Bears send a fifth-round pick in this year's draft to secure the offensive lineman. For your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Hour number three starts right now on a rainy Tuesday morning in Music City. Welcome in to RKW, brewed by Eighth and Roast. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh producing. I'm Will Bowling. Coming up in just about five minutes, Charles Davis of CBS Sports and NFL Network. He's a VFL who you hear every weekend right here on The Zone with our good friend Doug Matthews. He'll talk some NFL draft and NFL combine in just a few before VolQuest's Austin Price stops by at 8.30. Ron Slay of SEC Network and 3HL is coming up at 9.20. 615-737-1045, the number streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV. Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch, Twitch. Oh, he's winning today. It was probably a false start. Perhaps a false start. Five-yard penalty. We ain't got no ref. Replay the Ain't no down. umpires in here. You are the ref. I am the ref. One of these days, I'm just going to start by saying streaming live on Twitch, Facebook Live, YouTube, and Twitter. Oh, Twitter, no please. Twitch. please. Oh, Twitch, please. Oh, please. Be careful with that one. Yeah. Just My goodness. a bit outside. Is it? Okay. Doesn't All that right. sound like, that just sounds weird, Twitch? Uh, okay. I well, I got to beat Robert at something, okay? Well, oh. it's technically X. X, please. You've already X beaten please. me at life. I think you're okay. You're okay to, to drop a <laughs> oh, couple games to me. It depends on what life is. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I think it's think the matter. You're, I got, uh, I got, Ramon, I got. <laughs> R- Ramon blew a 3 1 lead to Burt on life, man. Dude, that, yeah, that's all I'm <laughs> On saying, Twitch, man. please. I've never, uh, I don't have friends in bad situations. So, Burt, everybody's in a good situation, man. We have been full of hate on the show this morning. It's how you know it's been a good one. Asking who is your least favorite player on your favorite team? And uh, we've got a lot of good submissions. I gave you one I, I had to give offline, and you somewhat agreed with me, too. Well, see, one. now you're teasing the people, Ramon. I can't do it. I know. I, I, know. I said when I brought up Ramon, I said, I don't want to put you in a rough spot because you had to play with a lot of these people. <laughs> yeah. We all, well, all of us just watched and yelled things from the upper deck, and you actually were in the in the foxhole with some of these guys. Uh, of those hateful people. That so call you know. us with your guesses. <laughs> we've yeah. had a lot of uh, Steelers fans, and it's not a Steeler for <laughs> what it's worth. Uh, We've had we've had Steelers fans vote for Antonio Brown and Chase Claypool. They yeah. say that, but they were in there just lo- Chase Claypool. Different conversation, but AB. <laughs> I mean, you say He's what you want good. to about him. Yeah. yeah. We're joined now on the phone lines, though, by our good friend Charles Davis, who you hear every weekend here on the Zone. He is a VFL. He's on CBS. He's on NFL Network. He is the busiest man in showbiz. Good morning, Charles. How are you? I'm doing well. Trust the three of you are terrific. 
We doing are. Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. We are great. Good morning. We are happy to be talking draft. Um, how special is this draft class specifically, Charles? The, the combine, and you guys do a great job with your coverage every year. I, I'm sitting there with with popcorn and just watching these crazy athletic scores come in. How much fun was this past weekend? You know, for me, it's just always my jaw just drops because, you know, let's face it, Ramon to tell you, and Ramon was, Ramon was legit. But all of us who played, you know, we always thought our time was just so special, and it was. But we just create, cre- keep creating these athletes, <laughs> and they just keep coming and coming, and you're like, are you kidding me? What am I watching here now? Does it always translate to being a good football player? Not always, but just in the sheer athleticism, the growth, what they're doing, and their opportunity, I would say, to do it on an almost full-time basis, that's a big part of it as well. They don't ever really stop training. Unless you're Tavondre Sweat, who wouldn't get on the scale at the Senior Bowl because he probably (laughs) weighed north of 385, and he got himself down to 366 for the combine. And he felt like he was big, sexy, and he went to work. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Davis, our guest this morning here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. So, Charles, let's jump right in as far as the Titans are concerned. Joe Alt and Peter Skronsky on the left side of a Titans offensive line sounds pretty good. How do you value that versus a pass catcher like Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors at number seven for this team? Yeah, I feel like we're having a Cincinnati Bengals conversation from a few years ago, aren't we? Remember, that was right. Panay Sewell versus Jamar Chase. They took they took Chase, went to the Super Bowl. Lions took Sewell, and last year got within one game of the Super Bowl. It all depends on your flavor and what you have. I will say this. If you think you've got that special left tackle in this year's class, I would hop on him. There are a lot of tackles, don't get me wrong. But if you think you've got a special one, I might go there. Because I do believe I can get pretty good value at receiver in almost any round this year. Charles, the other side of this conversation, man, I heard you guys talking about at some point is the idea that a lot of players went back to college. That's number one. But the other side of it is you're getting an older player coming out. And I heard you say, if I'm not mistaken, that the coaches don't side eye that as much as they used to in years past. Why is that the case? Ramon, is because the world changed on every one of us. The world changed with COVID. And once COVID kicked in and everyone got the extra year of eligibility, we had stop down action, you know, people lost time. Now we're trying to regain it. You have to play the hand that's dealt you. You know, before it was kind of like, I want the youngest kid I can get that's mature enough because guess what? Now I can mold, I can shape, and I can grow him during that time. Now they're counting on you doing that a little bit more yourself because you're going to come out a little bit later. It's just the way it is. And would they love to have you be 22 coming out? Of course they would. But you're not getting that. So at a certain point, either you adapt or you die, okay? He's going to be 23, 24, 25 coming out. Are we going to ding every kid for that? Because if we are, our pool's getting pretty shallow. And frankly... We're seeing where the experience is paying off for some of these kids. You know, sometimes having 48 starts at the quarterback position helps out. Brock Purdy. You're like laughing at Brock Purdy's time because I have 61 starts. Let's go to work. So that's what we're talking about, Ramon. I just think the world changed and everyone has to adapt to it. Otherwise, you're changing what your pool is and you're cutting down the number of prospects you're looking at. Absolutely. And and, and uh, one thing that never changes, though, Charles, is the two drafts that you have, the regular one and the quarterback draft. And in this quarterback right. draft, it seems like J.J. McCarthy is going to make himself a top 10 pick, depending on what the Raiders or what Minnesota or what one of those teams are doing. Why has there been a push um, as far as the, the publicity around J.J. McCarthy, if you, you feel like speaking on that one? I, I do think that a lot of it has been – he doesn't have the same body of work in terms of throws that the other the other five we're talking about potentially being first round picks. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, um, Drake May, Michael Penix, and Bo Nix. Right? When you really get down to their numbers, the number of times they threw the ball versus JJ McCarthy, it's a big number because Michigan played a different. Style. 
But does that mean that J.J. McCarthy can't do it? That's where it comes into the whole question. And that's where the evaluation process takes place, doesn't it? That's where you earn your money as a scout. You earn your money as a player personnel group because you have to project it. Did I see it on tape? I'll use it this way. We wondered if C.J. Stroud would run the football. Remember that going into last year's draft? Yep. And then they played Georgia. And you watched him take off a few times. And the old adage in scouting is, well, if you see it on tape, then you know he can do it. Guess what? C.J. Stroud did it pretty well last year for Houston. And look, you could find him do it on tape other places, but that game was the principal game because it's the game everyone was watching. So with J.J. McCarthy, can he throw the deep ball? You can find it on tape. Can he throw the out? You can find it on tape. Can he move? You can find it on tape. And by the way, his three-cone drill at the combine was pretty exceptional. So all of a sudden you're like, oh, he is athletic. <laughs> and now you take it and run with it from there. So you're right, and I will leave it with this, Ramon and, and, and crew. Bottom line is, yeah, he's probably put himself in top 10 territory for teams that may come up, as you've noted. But the Giants are sitting there at six. They have one more year on Daniel Jones's contract, and then they can get out. What if they can grab a quarterback at six, sit him for a year, and then, then plug him in. That sitting for a year thing, people tend to love, and it has kind of worked out in recent years. Charles Davis joining us this morning on RK Dub. Charles, you mentioned wide receivers, and you could find some value at any point in this draft. We saw from the combine some fast wide receivers in this draft at that. That is something the Titans have made uh, very clear they're looking for. Where would you see them maybe taking a wide receiver with no third-round pick this year? And, and who are your top candidates for maybe a fit there? Wow, that's a good one. Look, the bottom line, Kayla, is when you you look at what's out there, there's going to be a pretty good run on them right away. Okay, we know that. Harrison out of Ohio State. Adunze out of Washington. Um, you, you're going to have neighbors, Brian Thomas, out of LSU. It just goes and goes and goes. But then you start saying to yourself, okay, who else is out there? Is A.D. Mitchell, Adonai yeah. Mitchell, going to be available in the second round for you, or is he going to go in the first? What about Troy Franklin, who frankly did not have a great gauntlet drill, but you can't overlook the production at Oregon. The only thing that gives you a little bit of pause and concern is he's really linear, which means skinny, right? We're using all these buzzwords, right? So he's, you know, he weighed in at like 176, 177 pounds. Where do you go with that? Xavier Worthy, who blew the doors off at 421, he's 165 pounds. He's, a, you know, in, in my in my colleague Daniel Jeremiah's top 50, he was 41 going into the the combine. If you watch the 421, everyone's got him rising automatically to the first round. Will he? He may very well be there for you in the second. Is that the guy that you want? We could just go on and on and on, receiver after receiver. Kayla, it is a crazy number of them, and I've said it for the last three, four, five years, and I'm going to say it probably until they lower the, the lid on my coffin. <laughs> Every year we go into the combine, oh, yeah, there are plenty of receivers because of the way we're playing football now. Seven on seven exists. Seven on seven is a football's answer to basketball's AAU. When I was a kid, most of the time when the ball was in the air, it was off of an option pitch. Now it's in the air, you know, just pitching it around. We used to go get running backs out of Texas. Now we go get quarterbacks. The game has changed significantly. And because of that, receivers become a real glamour position. Charles, on the opposite side, uh, cornerbacks, I, I think this is a good draft, too, when you're looking at the talent at that position, also a position of need for this Titans team um, to kind of build that secondary. Who has really stuck out to you since the draft? Like, who impressed you the most up there? Well, look, I knew Quinion Mitchell was going to be a good player, and he confirmed it, okay? We knew, um, what's the kid at Alabama? Why am I blank on that Kool-Aid? The other guy. Uh, which one is that one? The other cornerback. Jeez, oh, Charles. Terry, Terry, Terry on Arnold. Terry yes, yes, yes. Terry on Arnold, yes. Yeah, Terry on Arnold. They are the top two, I think. Okay. All right? I think coming out of the combine, they've confirmed their status as the top two. Kool-Aid McKinstry didn't get a chance to work out because they found a fracture in his foot. 
And it's amazing because he said, I talked to him directly, and he said, I've been working out all the way up until they found the fracture in my foot. Wow. I didn't know I had one. Okay? So, you know, he's going to come out, but he will be ranking in there, of course. He'll be one of those guys. But then you start looking around. There's a kid out of South Dakota, and for whatever reason, I'm blanking again on his name, probably because i got too many names bouncing through my head right now. <laughs> but I really, really was impressed with him. I liked him going in. I came out of it really liking him more. The stopwatch might hurt him a little bit because he's not a flat-out blazer. But you talk about a tough kid, willing to tackle, come up and make plays. Look, Ennis Rakestraw in Missouri is one of those guys who is a more than willing tackler at the line of scrimmage and can cover people downfield. We're going to have some people. There's no doubt. I don't think the, the Titans have any issues at all about finding them. The issue is, as you said, no third-round pick. Yeah. So the decisions and what decision you make at the first round, is it a tackle or a wide receiver? The second round, are you coming back to get the one you didn't get before, you know, the tackle, the wide receiver? Or do you value the corner at that point? You better jump on him now because guess what? I don't have that pick, and everyone else is coming for these guys. So that's kind of where we're headed with all of this. I mean, the offensive tackle position, my goodness. The kid out of Washington, Fuaja, uh, Fuaja, terrific. How about Fuaga yep. coming out of Oregon State? Because you mentioned Joe Alt. I don't know that you're going to get Joe Alt. Joe Alt may be gone. All right? I'm looking at the Chargers. Imagine the Chargers taking Roshan or Slater and keeping him at left tackle and putting Joe Alt at right tackle. I think Justin Herbert won't run in to their brand new GM, Joe Hortiz, and hug him. <laughs> of course he will. He'll be thrilled. But at the same time, you look at their receiving core, and while we always talk about the Chargers' great receivers, Mike Williams is coming off of yet another injury. Keenan Allen is in his mid-30s and finished the season dinged up. They didn't get any value out of Quentin, uh, Mitchell, or, uh, Quentin Johnston out of TCU with their first-round pick last year. They have no tight end that, fe- that scares you. So what if you're the Chargers now, all of a sudden you go, you know something, maybe we pump it up differently. What if I take Brock Bowers, the tight end out of Georgia, and put him there? Well, if that's the case, if you're the Titans, you're jumping up and down. That means all might still be sitting there. You see where I'm going? This is how, how the intrigue of the draft and we haven't even gotten into, because Ramon, you brought it up, the Raiders are itching to make a move for a quarterback. Yep. And if they are, they might have to get up into four, five, six territory in order to get it done. Charles Davis, our guest this morning here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Charles, watching Lad McConkey go through the NFL Combine, I, I love him a lot more when he's not free and wide open against uh, our Tennessee volunteers, but it, could he be a Puka Nakua kind of playmaker at the wide receiver position for somebody in the NFL and maybe the Tennessee Titans as one of those day two options? He absolutely could, but he's a lot smaller than Puka. Mm. I mean, that's the thing. Like Puka's a bigger guy. And here's the, here's the weird part. Puka coming out of BYU, I was crazy about Puka Nakua, but here was the issue. He was hurt every single year he was in school. He comes to the Senior Bowl. I'm really excited. Good. We're going to see Puka Nakua. You can ask my guys. I was like, hey, before we even start, guys, Puka Nakua, take, keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on him. He was maybe the best player at the Senior Bowl last year on day one. Guess what happened? He got hurt. Didn't practice again. So that's why he went in the fifth round, okay, because he had had a history of injuries, and people were wondering if he could hold up. He goes his rookie year with the Lepner Rams. He was almost never hurt. So it's the craziest <laughs> thing I had seen. And, you know, it was funny. Um, the quarterback who came out there went to the Saints years ago and became, you know, the ultimate weapon everywhere. It's the same thing for him at BYU, and he's never been hurt in the NFL. So I guess the BYU guys, I got to find out what they're doing up there. <laughs> but, but when you put McConkie into that mix, you're talking about a superior slot receiver, who is a 7-Eleven guy, meaning always open. He's got a little Hunter Renfro to his game because he runs the routes that you would expect. But then I use that New Orleans term, that Louisiana term. He has a little land yap on top, that <laughs> little extra. That when, just when you think you're making a movie, he has that one last thing that he puts out there and finds himself open. And, Will, I'm with you. I like him a lot better when he's not running routes against Tennessee. <laughs> right, same. And he, and, and he, and he could very easily sneak into the first round. Could you imagine Patrick Mahomes going to Brett Veach in Kansas City and Oof. saying, you know something? 
I've won two Super Bowls for you without a great group of receivers. I'd really love to have that kid. Oof. Any chance you could grab him for me at 32? Yeah, that would that would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? Jeez, Charles, come on, man. He's bringing the heat. I know, he brings the heat. I, I have to ask you this, man. So Xavier Worthy ran at 421 officially. Yeah. And, and, and Charles, you know a good bit of people around the NFL, the industry, college football, and all things. You've seen these guys too, possibly, right? I, I saw yeah. a story just yesterday where Bo Jackson said that he yep. ran a 4-3 and pulled up at the end. And his coach told him, go run the doggone 40, right? And he claims, Charles, okay, he claims yeah. he was clocked at a 4-1. Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson. I've heard that. I've heard that before. It, yeah. Bo seems like a stand-up guy. Are you willing to believe that, or is it like <laughs> fishing? Listen, I'll put it to you this way. <laughs> Bo ran right over my chest enough times that whatever Bo says, I'm going to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw. I, I, play, I played against Bo in college. I actually have on tape where I tackled him one on one, and believe me, I keep it on a loop somewhere because he also has on tape the number of times he ran over me, and I had to readjust my pads and my face mask and question, but question whether I really wanted to do this anymore. He could do anything. I actually saw him play baseball at Tennessee. Okay, he came into town with Auburn. And you guys know baseball pretty well. Yeah. You know, what's the old the old rule in baseball? If you hit one to the left side of the field, you got you you better pull up at second because that's an easy throw and yeah. you're gonna be dead on third. He hit one in the gap in left center field at Knoxville that got to the fence. Guy takes it off the fence on one hop, it turns to throw, and Bo is pretty much yawning standing on third base. <laughs> oh. Incredible. And I saw it with my own eyes. And, look, I could do the fishtails and the whole deal. He got fooled on a pitch and got his hands out and realized he was fooled and managed to hold his hands long enough and then just threw wrists at the ball and hit it off of our scoreboard in right field on the old, on the old base before the baseball stadium was built. Oh, jeez. That was the Bo Jackson I saw. So if he says he probably ran 4-1, I'm not fighting him on that. <laughs> That's fair. He, 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 he was sensational. He was he was special. But look, with all these guys, let's just leave. Let's let's just put it in context. What Xavier Worthy did at four two one, sensational, special, the whole deal. No ifs, ands, or buts. Plus, he came in with a pretty decent grade. You know, my colleague Daniel Jeremiah, who I think is the best in the business at this, he had him at number forty one in his top fifty before the draft. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like he's just a guy. They could run fast, and now we're like, oh, now we got to figure it out. He has production. He has plays. We've got him on tape, right? So this is a legit dude running 4 2 one. If you now take the top 10 40s in combine history, adding his in, we have to see what happens with his career. So Chris Johnson, as you guys well know, CJ2K, mm -hmm. he was a legit dude, right? Big-time ball player, one of the best, all-pro runner, the whole deal. He made it. After that, the list really gets thin in the top ten. Marquise Goodwin, okay, yeah. decent career. I'm not trying to damn him with faint praise. Better career than I ever had, but you know what I'm saying. Put it in context. With that type of speed, you're expecting more, right? The rest of the top ten, you can't find a guy that really made much of a dent in pro football. John Ross, the record holder before at 422, went number nine in his draft to Cincinnati. Unfortunately for him, you know what he's going to become? A footnote. Why? Guess who got? Guess who went at number ten in his draft? Patrick Mahomes. Oh. Yeah. So this is what you have. Yeah, you can run really fast, but does it turn into production? When you look at the names, if you guys punch it up and punch up the top ten names, you call back and let me know which one of those guys you're like. Oh yeah. Uh, 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 mm. uh, that's, <laughs> that, that's what you're going to find. No offense to them. That's their attribute. That got them on the map, gave them an opportunity. But it doesn't always turn into them being an excellent ball player. Mm -hmm. I hope it does for Xavier Worthy because that was, that was fun to watch. There's no getting around it. Charles Davis has been our guest this morning on Ramon, Kayla, and Will, CBS Sports, NFL Network. Charles, uh, we enjoy following your work, man. I know you are very busy this time of year, so we appreciate you giving us a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Definitely, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Listen, I'm, I'm, Appreciate you guys. I'm no more busy than you are. Continued success to the three of you. Kayla, I don't know how you do it putting up with those two knuckleheads. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, I tried, Charles. I tried. I'm even here with a with a voice that's almost it gone. A try. Yeah. But bottom line, bottom line is continued success to the three of you. You guys are excellent. Keep up the great work, and hopefully, uh, we'll talk down the road. Absolutely. Appreciate it. There's Charles Davis with us this morning here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Coming up next, we shift gears and talk some balls with Austin Price on RKW. Hey, well, good news, we've reached March. Bad news is uh, maybe you're feeling a little down still, right? Uh, You're feeling like your body is a little bloated. You have no energy. You might want to know this. Toxins actually build up in your body. They're suppressing your immunity and your ability to absorb nutrients and fight illness. So the excess waste can cause you to prematurely age. Maybe you're carrying around that extra weight. That is why you need to change your body's oil just once in a while and try the Youthful Cleanse by Daily Defense. Look, simple cleanse, uh, no need to shake up your diet or do any of those juicer things. Uh, This is just a couple vitamins and a weekend to do your cleanse and you're good to go. It's almost like a reset button. So get yours today at membersnutrition.com. You can take control of your health, take control of your life. Try Youthful Cleanse today at membersnutrition.com.
RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose on 104.5 The Zone. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling, joined by our good friend Austin Price. All quested on three, discussing lots in Knoxville and lots of wins in Knoxville for Tennessee. What's up, Austin? How are you? I'm doing great, guys. How are you? Good. We are good, and uh, we just want to be half as good as uh, Rick Barnes probably feels after last week's wins over Auburn and Alabama. Uh, Austin, I'll start here. Has there ever been a better glue guy in college basketball than Jemai Meshack? Well, I'm sure there, there's been people comparable, but I mean, he really does just a little bit of everything. Well, obviously defensively, um, you know, he, he's been spectacular. Um, you know, his shots improved a ton, you know, and that's what Rick Barnes does a really nice job of. You look back at Kevin Punter when he first got here, you look at, at, at several other instances where he's taken, you know, guys that were, you know, marginal shooters and made them, better and and it's really impressive and then you know you can go back to last year when z goes down and jemai mayshack literally fills in as the point guard for tennessee's basketball team and, and did a really solid job so you know there are guys i'm sure around college basketball over the years that have been similar but uh he is really really good at just kind of being that swiss army knife and doing whatever it takes uh, in the moment whether it's guarding the one or even guarding the five Austin, when you look at Tennessee's wins last week, obviously you love what Dalton Connect did against Auburn, but the performance without him being a big-time scorer on Saturday it feels particularly noteworthy. What did you like the most just about the entire week for Tennessee hoops? Well, you start to see this is a couple of instances where they've won games on the road at Rupp and uh, at Coleman Coliseum where Tennessee did not have Dalton Connect going for 25, right? Like, you know, he, he was, you know, marginal and, and, and found a way to be, you know, successful and productive. And, you know, um, you know, the guys around him stepped up and played really, really well. And, uh, you know, Meshack, Z, Adu kind of, you know, due to foul trouble, just kind of had a solid second half, didn't play much in the first. You go back to that, that, that trip to Rupp and Josiah Jordan James was fantastic. So, um, they're just finding ways to win in different ways, and it, it, as, been, as it's been written the last you know week or so, it's more than just all and connect, and it's always been. Austin, when you look at this team as far as basketball is concerned, as far as them having older players, right? You have a guy that was documented, Santi Vescovi, that was literally coaching in the huddle on a break. Is is that one of the benefits and one of the expectations for him and Josiah Jordan James also? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I don't think just anybody could do that, but I think, you know, as smart as Santi is and as long as he's been in the program, he feels comfortable enough and Rick feels comfortable enough to let him do it. Um, you know, I, I think that you just get leadership. And, and at the end of the day, those two guys, they've been around long enough. They don't care. If, if they get six steals, no steals, 30 points, no points, they don't care anymore as long as the team wins. I, I, I really do believe that. I think these guys – are so one track mind win win win. They don't care if you know if it takes them getting eight points, to zero points, eighteen points, you know whatever. They're willing to do whatever it takes, and you know I, I think that they don't ever get you know bogged down or jealous that you know maybe some of their star power has diminished a little bit with Dalton Connect coming in here and, and doing what he's done. I think that they're just the uh, ultimate teammates, and that's what you want out of two guys that have been in this program for a while now. Uh, when you look at the job that Danny White's done, whether they're his guys or he's helped facilitate what's happened with Coach Barnes and look at Coach Vitello, and you also throw Heupel in there, man, um, is is there a better situation in college sports right now than what they got with those three guys? No matter if they're top 25 or top 10, you got to somewhat sit back and say job well done so far with those three guys in major sports. Yeah, hundred percent. They're, you know, all right now uh, have their uh, teams trending in the right direction. Uh, two of the three were here before Danny White got here. Um, but what he's done is he's, he's added to the culture of winning here uh, at Tennessee and, 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 and has, you know, backed, you know, Coach Barnes with the renovations to the to, to Food City Center coming and, and obviously the new renovations to Lindsey Nelson Stadium to give those coaches the ultimate uh, recruiting tool. Um, you know, he's, he's back Tennessee's collective. Um, you know, he hired Josh Heupel. Um, he's been behind him 
So, I mean, like, you know, he, you know, he's done a nice job with whether there were pieces in place or he had to go out and hire uh, pieces like Josh Heupel of finding uh, the best fit for Tennessee and, and all three right now are really clicking. Austin Price of Alquest joined us this morning on RK Dub. Austin, when it comes to maybe possibly still getting that number one seed, what do they have to do with two games left, South Carolina, Kentucky, but just, you know, beating Alabama, beating Auburn, that continues to, you know, hype up this resume, but what do they got to do to possibly get that one seed? Well, if they win at South Carolina, they'll be the one because they have the tiebreaker over everybody else, and it wouldn't matter if they lost to Kentucky. Um, you know, if they lose to South Carolina, then South Carolina would have the tiebreaker over Tennessee. They'd be tied with one game left, and then it would double down to what South Carolina does at Mississippi State and what Tennessee does at home against Kentucky. So, first and foremost, it's win tomorrow night. Um, technically, you know, they'll be the one seed if they win tomorrow night. Technically, they could still share the regular season championship if they, you know, won tomorrow night but lost to Kentucky and Alabama, you know, went perfect this week. Um, but it wouldn't matter as far as the one seed. So just win tomorrow night, and, and you're, you're going to be the one. And uh, outside of that, you know, I, I think Tennessee's, you know, fortunate from a standpoint of they're in this grueling gauntlet of a four-game stretch between last week and this week. But I think that's not a bad thing because I think this team plays better when it's, you know, when when, when the lights are brightest. Like, you know, I think that when they, you know, go to Texas A&M, go to Mississippi State, you know, even when they won a game at Missouri or even Vanderbilt early in the year. Like, I think when, you know, they go in thinking, okay, you know, we're supposed to win this game. And, and I know they say we take it one game at a time, but at the end of the day, they're still 18 to 22-year-olds. You, 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 the human element kicks in at some point, Kayla. So, I mean, like, I think the fact that this will be a hostile environment, you're playing for a championship. I think all those things bode well for Tennessee. Doesn't mean they'll win, but I think that you'll get Tennessee's best shot. What's your take on like the SEC SEC tournament in particular, though? Like with some of these teams who can catch fire, right? That are that are trying to get into the March Madness, or just teams like Tennessee that maybe don't need to win the SEC tournament. But when it's all said and done, you always want every accolade. I just feel like there's always some different takes on how you play in tournament play and how much energy you're and effort you're giving. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you talk to different people, they're going to tell you different things about the SEC tournament. Some are going to tell you it's better just to be one, you know, win the, win the two this week, win the regular season, you know, win the first game, you know, and get to Saturday in Nashville and then, you know, get on out of there and come home and get ready for the NCAA tournament. Like, you know, yeah. I – and then some people will say you never want to be that way. You want to go and win every game you play. And so I, I think the biggest thing is, is like with this group, you know, they're going they're going to compete hard. They're going to try to win every game they play. If I don't think if they if they lose, they're not going to sweat it. Um, you know, because I do think with with the addition of Connect and his ability to go get his and go create a shot on his own, I think it changes this team's dynamic in March. And then it really boils down to, you know. You know, kind of what the matchups are when you get to the NCAA tournament. So um, I, I don't think they're going to go into it with any kind of particular mindset. I think they'll just try to, you know, g- you know, go win every game they play. And if they don't, it'll be okay. And if they do, then they'll be holding up a trophy. He is Austin Price with us every Tuesday morning here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. If you're a Vols fan, you need a VolQuest membership, the authority covering Tennessee athletics. That's why Austin's with us Tuesdays. And Brent is with us on Fridays. Austin, we appreciate the time as always. Thank you. Hey, Will. Next time Kayla goes to Miami, you make sure you tag along. You I know. Need to get some color. Okay? <laughs> you need to get some color. Okay. You're right. You need to get some color. You're right. Uh, more time <laughs> l- searching for golf balls in the woods on the golf course so should help a little bit, yeah, Austin. I, but you're right. I can I can see you laid out on South Beach with a big glob of, of the suntan lotion on your <laughs> nose. Right. How'd you know? <laughs> You're shining well. Thank you, Austin. I appreciate, appreciate it, guys. Thanks, All right, Austin. there's Austin Price with us. More headlines on the other <laughs> side to finish off hour three next. It's Ramon Foster for United Structural Systems. You guys know this, man. If, if, if you are a parent of a kid in the spring that has outdoor sports, you know this time of the year, as soon as you get ready for that baseball, that soccer, that track, rain. 
okay, and rain on top of rain, and then it rains some more, and then you're delayed, and then you got to pick up other stuff. Why am I telling you this and, and, and about United Structural Systems? Well, that's because when it rains here, saturation around your house happens, too. The ground swells up, and it can't affect the, the flooding in your house. It can affect the waterproofing around your basement walls, causing them to bow. I'm telling you this. This type of uh, repair services that United Structural System provides for you will keep your home dry and stable for years to come. I promise you, you do not want those foundation issues. Your house shifting, the water in the basement, and it's flooding. You have no idea how it got there. Reach out to the teams that I trust and a lot of others, too, and that's United Structural Systems. Homeowners have trusted them for over 25 years to get the job done when it comes down to the uh, services they supply to you. If you have any foundation issues or flooding, they serve in Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, and Northern Alabama. You can reach them online at USSTN.com or call them 615 488 7855.
RKW is brewed by 8th and Roast on 104.5 The Zone. Ramon, Kayla, and Will. 615-737-1045. How you jump in? Question of the morning. Who is your least favorite player to ever play for your favorite team? Lots of your s- submissions on Twitter, at Ramon, Kayla, Will. And now on the phones, our guy, Danny in the borough, is up next. What's up, Danny? What up, Danny? What up, fam? What's going on? So, Ramon, you might you might be able to come at me with this one because I think you'll probably agree with me. But my my least favorite player to ever play for my favorite team is Vontez Burpin. There you go. Yeah. Said it earlier. So before you there. called in, Danny, Ramon actually brought this up and said, I I guarantee you Danny's gonna call in and say Vontez Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me tell you guys why. Let me let me talk about it here for a minute. Because yeah. I sat there and watched Marvin Lewis allow that man's vanity, ego, and pride to diminish Damn good football teams and what they could achieve. He put his ego and his stupidity ahead of the rules of the game that we all love, ahead of the players that were on his team and the safety of everyone else on the field around. Mm -hmm. Screw that guy. I mean, there's a movie from the 90s. It's called The Devil's Advocate. Great movie. Yeah. Um, De Niro. Not De Niro. Sorry. Uh, Anyway, the guy that plays the devil, his favorite, he says all throughout the movie, my favorite sin is vanity. The devil got to Vontez Burfick. Screw that guy. You're not that guy. Go to hell. <laughs> Stay away from my team. And, and Danny, what's, what's crazy is y'all had teams beat. Y'all had teams ready to submit. And he knocked out the right people in those games. And then he get a penalty to keep folks in it. Or he encouraged somebody running into the tunnels out of the game, at, you know, and get a big penalty. Like, yeah, he ruined it for you. That, 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 the, the Joey Porter incident on the sideline in the playoffs, the Bengals were about to end the playoff drought. They about had y'all beat. Oh. The game was over. A.J. McCarron at quarterback. Yeah. Shout out. But, my God, no, no, no. Vontez Perfect and his buddy in crime, Pac-Man Jones, douchebag number two on the oh. screen, ruined it for everyone. Danny. Thank you, Danny. We, we appreciate we, the call. We made it out of that one. I, don't, I still don't know how we won the game. That's, yeah. yeah. What year was that again? Uh, was it 14 or 15, I think? Yeah. 14 or 15, one of those two years. Was that when you ran into Tebow time after? Uh, was it Tebow? I may have. Uh, no. Was Tebow in around that time? Uh, uh, when was that game? When was that game? Godly. 20. Tim Tebow, 2012. It was 12? Yeah. Dang. 29, 23. I feel like the Bengals situation was later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. you're right. The situation was later. Yeah. Uh, Mary Claire on Twitter writes in at Ramon Kayla Will as a Preds fan, Ryan Souter. It's a good oh. pick. Okay. Oh. Okay. Ryan Souter, who still gets booed upon re entry into Bridgestone yeah. Arena. Oh. That's a good one. <laughs> Literally. That's crazy. Uh, Preds back in action tonight, looking to make it nine wins in a row as well. Yeah. 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 Dude, ever since coach called out the guys, yeah. they have completely turned it around. That's right. I love that sound. Sometimes you just got to get out there in public and, I hey, guess, bury your coast, guys a little. Coast through the media. Right? Coast through the media. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Andrew Burnett pushing all the right buttons. Yeah. That is for sure. Taking on the Montreal Canadiens. Canadiens. Tonight. 7 o'clock. Yeah, go get I was going to say, go go get in on that action while you can because they continue to win. It's going to be hard to get a ticket. So. Uh, I will be allowed to uh, see the sun and enjoy the rest of my day. Ronald Acuna will be ready for opening Let's day. Go. Braves just announced this morning. Let's go. Baseball is like almost back. It is We're here. almost back. Because it's earlier now that they report and the season, you is know. It? Yeah, they, they report a little bit earlier now. Hmm. They're done just a little before March now with minor leaguers, a lot of them reporting um, early for their, you know, designations. Okay. I saw an Instagram posting of young Michael Keith. Uh, at a spring yeah. game. I mean, at a, at a spring game. Saw that too. Yeah, he's in Arizona. Nice. Mike Keith is great on Instagram. He's like He's really it. good. good. And he put the right good music on Twitter to too, his posting too. Yeah. yeah, right. The music with his posting on social media is like, okay, that's pretty solid. There's a right. song choice with every picture. And there's a picture of all four voices of the AFC South that were on an OTP together. And I didn't know they were all friends. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. That's awesome. Uh, pretty solid. Yeah. 615-737-1045. Fourth and final hour up next. We'll recap what you've missed if you've slept in this morning. Don't blame you, but check out the podcast if you missed Charles Davis or Austin Price. Ron Slay coming up in just about a half hour's time. 
Two new mock drafts have the Titans doing two different things in the first round, including making a trade. We'll talk about it next. It's Ramon Foster for Artisan Customs Closet. Hear me out, y'all. Don't just clean out messy areas of your home. Get them organized with the custom store solutions available at Artisan Custom Closets. Artisan has every option for every budget and pain point in your house. From garages and mud rooms to pantries, home offices, closets, and laundry room, Artisan can do it all. Let the local team at Artisan help you get rid of clutter, maximize your space, and just make your day-to-day easier. Organization does it for you okay so me with their certified senior design consul, uh cons, consultant consultants jeez i'm messing it up right now i need to get organized on my words okay so fully customize a solution that fits your space you need from a free consultation at your home to the custom 3d plans that lay out your options and costs and installation process that take less than a day artisan makes it easier to create your calm simply simply reach out to them at 615-800-2199 or visit them at artisancustomcloses.com
9 o'clock. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh, less than a week away from free agency's legal tampering period, and teams are getting the cap space in order to make a splash or just solidifying one of the worst trades in NFL history. If you're the Denver Broncos, because they officially released quarterback Russell Wilson yesterday, just two years after trading a haul for him, releasing Wilson leaves an $85 million dead cap charge, the most in NFL history. For context, that's more than the next two Two highest dead cap charges combined. Now the 35-year-old former Super Bowl MVP is free to sign wherever he would like to ride. 3 p.m. today is the deadline for players to be franchise tagged. A couple players that could get tagged if a long-term deal is not agreed upon. Colts wide receiver Michael Pittman, Jags outside linebacker Josh Allen, and Ravens defensive lineman Justin Matabike. And some breaking news as about as three minutes ago, Jeremy Fowler reporting that the Jets Expected to release tight end C.J. Uzama should save about $5 million in cap space. Last year, he just had eight catches for 58 yards and a touchdown this past season. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Nine a.m. and a very pleasant Tuesday morning to you, wherever you listen or watch. Ramon, Kayla, and Will around Middle Tennessee and the world. Craig, Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh is our producer. I'm Will Bowling. Coming up in fifteen minutes, he is on your television sets on the SEC Network, on your radio dial on Three HL every weekday from three to six. The busiest man in show business. Ron Slay will join us <laughs> coming up in 15 minutes. RKW, as always, is brewed by 8th and Roast with locations on 8th Avenue, Charlotte, the airport, and the Broadview at Vanderbilt. 8th and Roast Coffee cultivates community by the cup with a new spring menu Ooh. that I see on their Instagram page, which looks scrumptious. Let's go. Scrum dilly umptious. I was just about to say that. You were? I was. So you <laughs> oh, I saw the so trucker hats when I was at the airport. They had them for sale. Nice. Did they? They are, I was so tempted, you guys, but then I was like, my bag's already full. Ah. I know. I'm okay. They're cool, though. Don't let that bag They're very cool. The time. I know, right? I could have just worn it. So, yeah. Headlines this morning where The Athletic has a mock draft including trades. Round one only. And with Joe Alt on the board, the Athletics' Dane Brugler says the Titans would trade out of seven, taking picks 11, 109, and a 2025 second rounder from the Vikings, who would take J.J. McCarthy at number seven. This has the Titans moving back to 11 in that swap with Minnesota, taking 342-pound left tackle J.C. Latham from the University of Alabama. I don't care about nothing but the tie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to say the other that version. Video of that. is so good. <laughs> I want to see the other version of it, but I don't want to get fired on on my day working. Uh, but that, that's fascinating. The, the issue that you run into when you're trading with Minnesota is you want that three this year. In my opinion, yeah. uh, it, it, it sucks to lose a round as far as not picking in one of those thirty two picks in the in the third round, but. You pick up a fourth is what they're offering or what it was projected they will offer. And the issue is Minnesota also doesn't have a third-round pick themselves, which is why dealing with them, you need to be very creative in what you're asking them for. You may even ask for a player if that's the case. Um, I doubt they give up Jordan Addison or anybody like that. But right. the conversation of I need a little bit more, to your point, Will, a little bit ago, I know you're going for a quarterback. This also saves your job if you hit on this quarterback. So why should I not benefit from it? Earlier, I said I take the 109, not realizing that 109 was a fourth round. I pick. know. It's like on the cusp. Yeah, on but the yeah, cusp. But that's, that's 32 picks you're missing out on. And I, I don't want to live that life for this team that's trying to rebuild. Well, because the Las Vegas Raiders have a third rounder. So maybe 
if they are a trading partner, they need a quarterback. Possibly they take a guy like J.J. McCarthy, trade up. Then you could get a third rounder. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you need more, obviously. But you just have to have that if you're going to do a trade, I think, to trade down. Mm-hmm. In this scenario, the Titans would pass on Joe Alt, who would then be picked eighth by the New England Patriots, who Dame Brugler thinks swaps with Atlanta, going from eight to three. And then there's a run on tackles. Tale Fuaga, nine to the Chargers in a swap, hypothetically, that they would make with the Chicago Bears. Olu Fashanu at 10. And yes, if you did not hear the show yesterday, it is Fashanu. For those of you who like him, ourselves included, and had to be corrected on that when he spoke to the reporters of the Combine and said it is Fashanu. And then J.C. Latham at 11. Uh, We talked yesterday a bit, Ramon, about what Bill Callahan will want in a lineman trait-wise. And you mentioned fast feet and big bodies. Uh, J.C. Latham is a massive human being. Are his feet fast enough? I think they are. Uh, and his hips are fluid as heck, too. He is uh, aggressive. Uh, as as many people who are high on Tyler Fuaga, J.C. Latham holds those same traits. I'm talking about very physical in his, uh, in his, in his run blocking, down blocking, blocking out. He has that, has good hands. One thing, and I read it, and when I when I read one of his deficiencies, it does line up with this tape, but this is also a teach thing. He does set back, like, deep. Like, he doesn't have a point of stopping. And as an offensive lineman, you have to get to your point and have a battle point. His battle point continues to drift back. Didn't you say that about Andre Diller this past year, too? I did, I did but here's the thing, the difference. You got to have an anchor. Okay. So the way I felt about Jordan Morgan, the tackle from Arizona, was he didn't have a point of stopping. Like, absorbing the bull rush is something that's a part of your job, too. They're going to try to run through your face. Uh, the same thing that we said about Olu F- uh, Fashanu. 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 Yeah. Fashanu. The thing like fashion th- with an anu. New. Yeah, the same thing that I said about Fashanu. Fashion who knows he has size, knows he has the strength to be able to stop guys. So he received a good bit of bull rushing, too. And I'm not sure if it's because they said he has small hands and those types of things, too. But his double under technique invites his chest. When you punch, sometimes you don't expose your chest to the defender more times. When you come under with your arms, teams will run, got, defensive ends will run through you. So the bull rush stopping is a technique thing. Some guys, if what they want to call them, look too light in the tail when it comes down to stopping that type of stuff. I don't know when. Like, there is a science to knowing when to stop and also trusting your athletic ability that I think players have a hard time adjusting to. Just because I'm getting pushed back doesn't mean I'm losing. I grudgingly stop to a finish. Isn't Mims at that spot, though? Like, that was a guy you really definitely were talking about as – Somebody that if he's there, if they trade down, maybe you take a guy like him over a Latham. Latham also a right tackle, I, right tackle. I, I believe, where you would and I probably feel better, need to work with him at left. And I feel better about Amarius Mills moving over to the left than I okay. do about C.J. Latham. I think yeah. C.J.'s – or J.C. J.C. Latham. Yeah. Um, I think he's probably a better right tackle okay. if you're in that market for one of those types of guys. I say Amarius Mills because of his lack of reps – um, his athletic ability that we saw and um, his size would probably be better suited to move over to the left. So the stuff that I, I would say is is this, and um, I heard Thray Cheldon drop this yesterday, uh, OLJ, Olan Jesus is what they're going to call. I was call him Jesus because <laughs> I don't want to use Jesus' name in vain like that. Olan Jesus, okay? There you go. Is a guy that you trust that if you're talking about J.C. Latham not knowing where his point of attack is or the bull rush, that's all technique stuff. I'll never forget when Munch first came into the building with us. He said, Ramon, I need you to get vertical. I'm like, Coach, I play guard. He said, trust me. I said, Coach, but you want me to kick like a tackle? He said, trust me. And he pointed out what my strengths was. Get to a point set and invite them to fight mm-hmm. with you. That's what you're asking. And at that point, where my attacking point is, I win that one more times than not. If I'm giving you a two-way go and I'm beating you more inside than outside, then guess what? You're playing my game. You're not dictating what I'm doing. And that's where a guy like J.C. Latham, also Amarius Mims with the lack of reps that he has, and I'd even also throw, depending on what this team wants to do in the first round, I'd still throw Jordan Morgan in there because of the coach. Okay. And because of what I expect him to do. We saw DeWan Jones, who had some questions, big body guy, 
look like he's going to be the future right tackle for the Cleveland Browns moving forward because of what Coach Callahan And he was called the project, Moan. Like, he was. He was And was thrown into the fire probably sooner than he needed sure. to. So, I'm, I'm giving yeah, them grace point. with these type of dudes. And, again, I said this to uh, somebody else uh, yesterday. I think Jordan's Morgan Senior Bowl was somewhat skewed, and I don't know why. Because his Arizona tape, and shout out to Deron, to Ron Davenport for putting this out there sooner. Uh, he was a high on a Jordan Morgan earlier. His Arizona tape is way better than what he did at the Senior Bowl. Oh, yeah. It just was. Now, I ain't sure, respectfully, Caleb, this is a Pac-12 issue, or is it he just had a bad week against other players from other conferences? I don't know which one it was. Um, but his Arizona take is impressive. Interesting in this mock draft as well, uh, your former employer, Pittsburgh Steelers, are mocked to trade with the Seahawks and draft Amarius Mims at 16. Some Georgia tackles. Uh, yeah. And that trade would be the Steelers sending 20 and 84 to move up to 16 and getting 151 as well in return from Seattle. Dame Brugler tweeted it over the weekend saying, Amarius Mims is his most fascinating player in the draft. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a little bit of misinformation out there because a short shuttle time was attributed to Mims that actually wasn't Amarius Mims' short shuttle time at one point over the weekend because he did not go through that drill. But the point still remains that at six foot eight, 340, the flexibility and dexterity that that guy has, I think is probably a good way to put it, at 340 pounds gets your attention. And I know that we said that about Isaiah Wilson as well. <laughs> <laughs> but this ain't Isaiah Wilson. Hopefully Marius Mims doesn't have a rap career. And, hold. and yeah. that's where I was as far as saying we can't judge one guy the same way we did another. 100%. Right. No, that's not pros, fair. You can't. Yeah, that's that's totally unfair. Yep. But I understand the anxiety. Yeah. I get it. Yep. 615-737-1045 is the number. Coming up next, he is Ron Slay. No other introduction needed. Next on RKW.
Hour number four on a Tuesday morning edition of Ramon, Kayla, and Will, RKW, brewed up by Eighth and Roast. Coming up in a matter of seconds, 3HL and SEC Network's Ron Slay will stop by. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling with you. Robert Walsh, our producer. Ours. He belonged to us. That's our guy back there, man. Proud of you, Bert. That is right. Bert's been working his head off, too, man. He's been booking folks and calling folks, getting turned down. But you know what? One door closed, he opened up 15 more, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Book specialist back there. Doing it. Doing it well. I'm talking about. Okay. That was that was all you get this quarter, Bert. We're done. This quarter? Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's it. You can't be bringing him up like he that. He was also man. awake at 6 a.m. Yeah. That's because we got him going on some player hatred mm-hmm. stuff, which I'm all into We also, so... So there is a new ESPN NBA mock draft out as we talk a little bit of hoops. Mm. What we got going on? NBA. Wow. Where do we think Dalton Connect is ranked is why I bring it up. I'd put him uh, 12 to 15. 12 to 15. Because international. Kayla? Always. I know. Now it's changed. I I want to say top 10. Number 12. Okay. Or excuse me, 13 actually. 13. Okay. You were right on it. From 12 to 15. As Ron Slay waltzes his way into the studio. He's in the building. Yeah. <laughs> He's in the building. <laughs> Sound effects and all. What's Where'd you get that up? Nike hoodie from? This uh, ESPN.com article, uh, Jeremy Wu writing about Dalton Connect as the number 13 player in the NBA draft. Uh, previously ranked number 18. Ooh, moving, he moved up. Oh. Ron Slay moves his mic towards the scene in the studio. Uh, Dalton Just Connect, to... number 13 in an NBA <laughs> okay, mock hey. draft. Too That's high, too low. Say it again. Dalton Connect, ranked number 13 in an ESPN.com mock draft. That about right? It's hard for me to, um because I don't know what, what the European mix got going on there with the, go. um, the the overtime elite league, what all that got going on. But, man, I think he's top 10. And <laughs> Thank I, listen, you. I mean, you, ah, you know what I mean? I just, I, it's. What are you what, what you looking for? I know. You know what I'm saying? Like and tell me what 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 boxes he doesn't check. You know what I mean? Like are you talking about going to a a league where it's not world beaters for defense, you know what I'm saying? So, yes, you need to if you're nitpicking at this game, hey man, you need to be a better defender. Okay, cool. Are you bringing me to your team to be Patrick Beverly? You know what I'm saying? Or are you bring me to your team to be a guy that can make shots from the outside when the stars get doubled? Right. Two totally separate things. So I think he's worked himself in um to that top ten, that top ten spot, man. Just you never know what Europe is gonna bring. Dude, you know that's what I'm changed a lot though, it Slay. Is. Cause like it didn't used to be nope. like that. Nope. You used to be able to see it and be able to know and stamp it and be like, boom, that's that's definite. But now it's the game going global like it is. And then the game getting younger like it is, yeah. it almost punishes you for being a guy like this, a, a fifth-year guy. You know what I'm saying? I, I still never understand it when you got guys playing to 35, 36 years old. Like, what does it matter if you come into the league at 22 now? Why should that be kept against you if, you, if you're if you not coming in at 19? You know what I'm saying? Like, right. with yeah. the three, like it, it's, it's just weird, man. But, man, this game speaks for itself. I think that's the best thing. <laughs> You got going National Player of the Year um, considerations should be in order. Um, it's 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 special what we're getting to see. Like I thought, it keeps changing, man. Like when I saw Jabari, what he did for Auburn, I'm sitting there like, yeah, Lee. Hmm. Like I don't know if we're gonna see this like this much of a threat. He's six ten, yeah. doing it all inside outside, and and can he just moves like a gazelle. He puts them on his back when he needs to. Like, dang, this is special. Next year, you see Brandon Miller. Then I'm like, man, Brandon, the guy, Lee, boy. <laughs> this dude, man, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, like, almost 6'8". Like, he can do it all, man. He, offensively, defensively, look what he did with Alabama. All these teams, Auburn won it with Jabbar. Brandon won it with Alabama. Then you get Dalton Connect coming along. You're like, Wow. We're seeing it again. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, year in and year out. And these guys are consensus all Americans. You know what I'm saying? The only thing that you don't check the box from is one of them taking their team to the Final Four. So that's why it's so important. You got to be able to get that get that going. But hell yeah, you should be a top 10 pick. We'll lead the circle back around. Uh, it's crazy, too, uh, real quick, just wrapping a bow on this that the top two players on this list are both just French guys who are playing elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Zachary. 
Reese Ashe. There we go. That was terrible. What team, anyway. was, he, what team was he playing for? Uh, J.L. Borg. Uh, yeah, I hate. Uh-huh. I gave him that work, but yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, man. Hey, yeah. Hey, I got film yeah. on too. Yeah, I'm I ain't even I can just blow on yeah, I'm blowing. Hey, is my rep in there? Hey, Bert, they better know. They do. Tell them we'll bring the footage back a little later. You know what I'm saying? Just make sure my representation is up there and alert. We're going to bring the footage back a little bit later, Ron. I just wanted to double check with me brother. and make sure that we're on the same page. That's it. That's my brother. Yeah. And we were. That and we were. Simple. You know what I mean? It's my and guy we always there, man. <laughs> yeah. That's real. Uh, Slate, last week there was a lot to like about what Tennessee did. Uh, the win over Auburn, allowing you bragging rights over Don Davenport and half bragging rights over Joe Hunk since he's got a foot <laughs> in both camps. Yeah. yeah he's uh, three quarters <laughs> Auburn, though. I think he's still like a quarter oh. Tennessee. Some I don't. Hey, my goodness! Don't he's ask got, me to explain it. I ain't got a clue. He's got it's eight just, toes in the Auburn camp, two yeah, toes in the Tennessee camp. Him. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Um, God, between wild, everything so. that happened over the last week, <laughs> you can get excited about Dalton Connect just absolutely going unconscious against Auburn. Yeah. Jemai Meshack being the the X factor against Alabama. You got Santiago Vescovi drawing up plays in the middle of a timeout Mm -hmm. in Tuscaloosa. Out of all of those things, what gets you most excited about this Tennessee basketball team's last week? Um, With all those, as you already mentioned, um, Zakai. Zakai being that that catalyst, um, playing like he missed this part of the season last year, Um, knowing that the heart, like, yeah, a lot of people say the heart and soul is Meshack, and I don't disagree, but, man, you don't you don't pull this car to the garage unless you got him sitting right down the driver's seat. Ain't no ill fans of bust about it. This young man here plays differently. He gives this team a different attitude. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's different. Usually you get that from an enforcer like Euros. You know what I mean? Like he's gonna be the guy to go in there, punch somebody in the throat or something. Not literally, but you know what I'm saying? Like he may too at the same time. But Zakai he, he's different, man. He's different. He can affect the game from the inbounds. You know what I'm saying? Either way, either on offense getting the ball or defense picking up the ball. And that's something, that's something different. I think when you look at it, guards win tournaments. And that's this is coming from a yeah. big man. You know what I mean? Like, it's if you got a dominant man, guard. Baby, right? just, yeah, you know what I mean? I think a big can go win a game for yeah. you. But as far as a tournament, the guard get hot. He can go and scorch you. You see what the young fella did for Kansas State last year, going in their conference tournament, trying to carry them all the way to Final Four. But I think Zakai has an impact, man, like no other. You look at those 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 times where Dalton Connect was in foul trouble, and in a sense it was a lull in the offense. And a lot of people look at him like, man, he shouldn't be shooting that many threes. But who else was going to shoot it? You know what I'm saying? Like, he would go back and revert back to last year when the ball was swinging side to side. They running a good set, and everybody pump faking on the shot. Even Santi can't get his shot off. Sometimes your best offense is just put the ball on the rim, especially if you got Adu and Tobey Walk in there. He shot a, a long three. Uh, a Walker tipped it. Adu tipped it out. Zakai came up with it. You know what I mean? He, got a, uh, he, he put the nail in the coffin with the three-pointer after that play. So it was like... Sometimes, man, you just got to be willing to take that shot. Zakai don't care. Like, it, it go in, it don't. I ain't, I ain't supposed to be in no way. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? So I think, yeah, man, Zakai and Josiah. I got to give credit to Josiah. Him and Santi going down the stretch, keep on scratching your head, running, running, wondering where the plays and the impact as far as numbers are. But this young man, Josiah, going there and get double-double with your two bigs in foul trouble, and he plays the five. You know what I'm saying? The game before, Santi goes and gets the big offensive rebound to put the nail in the coffin against Auburn while everybody else is standing and watching. Plays like that, man, that veterans can make. You know what I'm saying? What's one of the biggest step-ups is this picture right here, and I'll explain it in a second. It's Dalton Connect Duncan against Auburn, and you got Jani Mm -hmm. Broom looking at one of his teammates with his hands out like, where were you at? Yeah. Was that probably the most crucial point? My best on your best and watch my best win? Yeah, and I think Baker Mazar was doing a terrific job on him. So you got to give credit to Barnes for taking a set. You usually run a double exit set. Double exit is when, the say, Dalton Connect is standing under the rim. You got two bigs on each elbow you know so Tobey's on one elbow and Janai Broom or Josiah's on one broom one elbow and Jonas A. Dude's on one elbow that's an easy exit but you can switch it he took that unconventionally and put it in the corner 
and let Dalton Connect choose which way he's going to go off. Baker Mazar was doing a good job, but he got got tired. Like, everybody gets tired of getting banged, then running and chasing. You don't know what he – this man might pull from 30 feet, might go to the basket. So they start switching to try to deny him. Broom didn't do a good job. He caught it out. And, man, then it was it was, it was was showtime at the Apollo with, um, with him out there. That hesitation – um, and the 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 part that you can't can't um can't overlook is he was looking at his teammates like where's the help, but his teammates looking at him like I can't leave these shooters in the corner like the floor is spaced enough where you get an opportunity to operate. I wish I you want me to leave him and give up the three it's really gonna be over and don't connect showing that down the stretch he's able to get the ball up and trust his teammates and it makes a better team. I think that's also what you saw in the Bama game. So twofold mm-hmm. for me, uh, him giving the ball up in the Bama game yep. was huge because earlier in the season against not Carolina because he went off, but those <laughs> was a Purdue, and then You're who right. else was the top? Mm-hmm. You're right. He was going through, and this was mm-hmm. it frustrated me crazy. Yep. I hit you up. Was like, yep. why does he keep trying to go through double teams? Yeah. Yeah. And that growth that we've seen from him. And that moment right there was big, and also the confidence of his team. Even with a guy like Jordan Gain, he went over yeah. six from the three. Still yep. passing and giving it up. Yeah. That growth right there, I think, is what translates over to the NBA game that they probably was looking for. That's right. And that's, that's a playmaker. You know, a playmaker and being an alpha on the team, especially on the offensive side, you got to make everybody else better. How do you make everybody else better? You got to give them an opportunity. So what they do, you trust and they do to set that screen and be able to roll short, be able to get the ball and make a right decision, not turn the ball over. Uh, the same for Josiah when he comes off of it. Everybody, man, you got to be trusting the guys because – if I'm South Carolina coming up in this next game or I'm Kentucky, yeah. I'm doubling you like Alabama did. Like, I'm not letting you – somebody else got to beat us. It's got to be that simple. But you need guys like Ganey, Josiah to make shots, Zakai, Santi, Mayshack when given the opportunity to make shots. So, I, I think, man, a, a lot of that is um, falling on connect. And if you give it up early, when it comes to closing time, you see who was there. Ain't nothing you can, <laughs> ain't nothing you can do. Nothing Double you if you do. want. And then does somebody else make you pay? But it's because everybody else has a rhythm as well because he wasn't just keeping it in his hands. Well, you got Alabama, Auburn, check, check. You got South Carolina coming up, Kentucky to end the regular Mm -hmm. season. Like, if they win out, for me, Ron, like, it's so hard to to see them and Lenardi and them denying this Tennessee team a number one seed in the trip. I just, I I don't know. Maybe that's me just because I'm watching these guys every night, but... It, and I get it, Houston, and mm-hmm. but that, look at the resume. Yeah, the resume and down is right the though. stretch, especially. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I think, man, the only thing, the pushback that I would give is, do we want them to take it all the way on the West Coast for the last? And that's four the, spot? that's a good. Point. And, I, and so Rather I almost two, think maybe. that if they really paying attention, like, do you give them a tip of the cap and say, sure. okay, we will keep you right here as a number two. You know what I'm saying? Good like, point. I mean, numbers say that you got to be a number one to take. It's easier to be a number one to make that run. But yeah. I, I think, man, when this team is this good, I don't think they have to worry about fans traveling. I think <laughs> everybody, everybody going to hit the road. When you're this good, it's this much hype around it. You just got to go and handle business. So I do expect them to, to try to close it on out, man. And look how beautiful this is when you're talking about SEC, a team that was picked last and the team that was preseason first, in a, in a sense, playing for the SEC regular season title. It don't get much better that's than that. That's crazy. You know what I mean? So that's why I think you got the national player of the year and you got the national coach of the year, and they're about to go head-to-head. It's that simple. Ron Slay at 3HL and SEC Network, our guest, as he is every Tuesday at 920 here on the show. Um, and this thing. And this thing. Are you ready for Music City to turn into Meowzik City again next weekend? I, you know oh, what? I hope so. I, I hope so. I hope they come in here in full effect. You know what I mean? It's going to be all good. And they listen, they supposed to. They got a, 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 a great class that came in. If they come in healthy, it's going to be cool. But, boy, they got, they got something to deal with. They got something. They, listen. I expect Florida to travel. Yep. I right. expect Tennessee to travel. I expect Alabama to travel. Sure. I expect Auburn. Auburn's been. So they live here. Yeah, I, they, <laughs> yeah they do. Like, they've been. I they've live been. Everyone. Man, they've been harping on it in post game um, press conferences and everything. Like, hey, man, we need y'all to travel. It's different. So I expect Auburn to come out in droves. Wow. That's not, it's not going to be nothing compared to Big Blue Nation because they bought their tickets last year. <laughs> Whenever they went on sale, you know what I'm saying. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But man. 
It's going to be a fun tournament, dog. And I, I, it's going to be fun starting on Wednesday this time. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Oh. With these teams like Georgia and all these teams that are vying for that spot to try to get on the run. Vandy. Vandy. Yeah, yeah that's going to be tough. I was, you know what? I ain't going to do it today, Willie. Oh, I was right. He baited you. He baited you. I was about. I was, I was, I was, <laughs> you mentioned everyone else. I, said, so I was, was going to Like, okay, <laughs> see, this is my thing, though. You can't uh, be. I'm backing off. You can't be fair weather, though, Savage. You can't be fair weather. What I saw last year out of them, out of that fan base, dog, we were sitting on set, and I told yeah. them, y'all got to turn it up. Turn my, what is it, IMB? IFB, yeah, IFB, IFB, yeah. Dude, turn it. I can't hear. Yeah. Like, and I told Dar, I was like, hey, man, stop, man. Like, listen to this. Why couldn't that spill over this? I don't give a damn about your record. I don't give a damn about your record. Why couldn't that spill over? Missouri, they still packed that arena out sure. over in Como. Every single oh, Arkansas yeah, still does. packed Facts. it out. Man, all that fair weather stuff, man. That's my bad, guys. No, nah, it's cool. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. <laughs> but I, that's a good point. You know that's what I mean? a good like, point. They don't, they don't support their team in the same yeah, city where they play. So I don't need to hear nothing. Yeah, right. And with the road environments now Come in on, the dog. SEC, in particular in basketball, yes. like you can't you can't just stop for a year. No, you can't. You can't. And then try to pick back up. No. The thing is, no, you got Texas in, in, in Oklahoma. You know what they're going to be? Texas and Oklahoma are going to do when oh. they come here? Cover their mouth and be laughing at them and pointing. Take over. Like, this yeah. is what y'all had in there? Right. Come on, dog. So. It was crazy. I've met, as of lately, you mentioned Vanderbilt, uh, two of their uh, officers that travel with the basketball team. So yeah. I've met two of them as of late. I'm just, one, I was with uh, my oldest at a, at a, at a facility last mm-hmm. night and ran into them. I'm like, why well, I keep running all these, bas- uh, these Vandy uh, basketball officers? Yeah. Man. Really pleasant dudes. Mm-hmm. It's just me trying to give a little credit to Vanderbilt. It's mm-hmm. like, man, y'all got some good people surrounding you. Yeah, y'all got some good officers. Yeah, y'all do, man. No, too bad they don't hey. dribble. Slay, I've got a, I got a slight bone to pick, man. I don't know what if up, I can. Bert, Bert? I don't know if I can represent you anymore, man. Oh, wow. You were talking about uh, your your days in Europe, so I had to look up the highlights. And oh, I, I, mor- for morality reasons, I don't know if I can I can uh, be your be your lawyer anymore because how many of these European men you assaulted? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is one highlight video up against AJ Milano. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Dude, you scored thirty three points, and they didn't have a hope. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> they did not, yeah. In some baggy clothes. If y'all put Ron Slay in the in the athletic <laughs> gear of today, he was doing this with almost tripping over his daggum pants. Come on, yo, man, That's talk awesome. to him, Bert. You, know you I mean? should have seen what happened when Vandy brought out the Pearl Cone Marching Band at Memorial Gym before they played Tennessee, and what Ron Slay then did. Hey, man, all, all you got to do is, man, put the lights on. Give me three officials. I'm going to give you a show. Yes. I promise you that, man. Make sure that popcorn popping. Make sure you're in your seat before the game start because you're going to get every bit of a show. Crazy show, good we show, bad yeah. show. It's going to be a show. Be you just got to be there. That's why my favorite when I'm watching Paul Feinbaum and Slay yeah. appears with Paul on yeah. set. <laughs> it's the best it's dynamic be ever. It's a couple it's of be oh, I love just talk it. Be some. Yeah, it's yeah. so fun. I told Paul, man, he got to let me go on and run that show one time. And he was like, you know what? You ought, you ought to sit in on it. I said, you if should. I can answer them calls, <laughs> right? give me that all day. I would love Dude, that content, Man, like. them call. Hey, listen. I'm sitting there listening to them callers, but some of them ain't got a clue. They ain't right. And I love it. Like that is That's Howard that Stern for sports. It is, man. Yeah. Wow. It's uh, and I've been looking at Paul like, dude, you sitting over really asking. He's like, calm as yeah, day like, day. okay, I, man, give me that time. Give me about an hour with that, Paul. I'm cool with it. I don't even see how he does it. I don't it's either. weird. And it's so hot in Paul's studio. I told him, dude, this is a sauna. That's a, that's well, a, I, I mean, a Paul's a gentleman. A, he's like he's 130. Yeah, he's like, I, I, not literally, but you know what I mean? He's a <laughs> tiny, tiny dude. Yeah, I'm like, 130. Dog. I'm in that mode sweating. <laughs> you like to be some water? Yeah, dude. It's trying to be 130. Yeah, ain't nothing wrong with it. Anyway. anyway. I'm floating the wind. Uh, let's talk more <laughs> matchups with Ron Slay coming up next. The differences in matchups between South Carolina and Kentucky for Tennessee this week. Two teams that maybe couldn't be more different next mm. with Ron Slay.
Wrapping up the show on RKW, brewed by 8th and Rose, Ramon, Kayla, and Will in the building. Coming up tomorrow morning, we'll have Rhett Bryan early at 8.20 tomorrow before ESPN's Matt Miller will join us at 9.20. 3HL and SEC Network's Ron Slay in the building with us. What up, doe? Slay, what about the South Carolina matchup is so challenging for Tennessee compared to teams like Alabama and Kentucky that have not played a second of defense this year. South Carolina is yeah. the polar opposite. Yeah, they, they, they're they going to get to it. They they play their style. They stick with it um, regardless of if they're up 20, down 20. It does not matter. They're going to play the same way. They bring that old school Wisconsin style, you know what I mean, um, to to the game. Lamont Perry has done a good job of getting guys to believe in each other. Um, they play better when it's not just one person dominating, um, but they do have that star that can carry them across the finish line. Saw it in Michi Johnson. B.J. Max done it. Talon Cooper's done it. Colin Murray Boyle is probably my favorite player in the SEC. The young freshman is a dog. Um, I, I do think, though, in that game with Tennessee, at Tennessee, they were able to beat them, but I don't necessarily think it was too much of what they did. I think Tennessee just missed shots. You know, I mean, you had looks. You just – it was one of those games you was a little lethargic. You know what I mean? You you defended. You know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't no high-scoring game, but you just were – you were missing the open shots. And you need to, um, you need to be able to, you know, make some make some more – make some shots when you go to uh, Colonial because it's going to be rocking. Um, and the, they play well, though. They play well, though. They feed off the crowd. The crowd understands. Um, it carries right over from women's basketball. Don Staler may be in attendance. It's, oh, no, she's in Greenville, so yes. she'll probably be in Greenville. <laughs> <laughs> so it may work out for us. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Get the goat up out of there. So what's the difference this time around? South Carolina knows what's coming yeah. into their building. South Carolina also knows they're on a revenge tour. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. What, what's their – no, screw that. What's the Vols mindset? Yeah, I think that's that. That is what the um, Vols mindset is: righting the wrongs. You know, what I mean, you circle this on your calendar. I thought this was going to be big when they um when they played against Texas A and M again, being able to play them one more time, and they they lived up to it. I think it's going to be the same thing with this South Carolina game, knowing that you can have this under wraps as far as the SEC title. You expect it to be a difficult game, but an SEC title before walking into Senior Day. Um, you know, with uh, Kentucky right there with it and trying to make amends for what happened last year um, when Chris Lofton's jersey retirement was ruined um, Ooh, by Kentucky. So you got that. You got senior day. Um, it's going to be a lot going on um, on that Saturday. So if you can wrap it up against South Carolina, you know, and, and win this thing out right, uh, I think that's enough motivation in itself, especially coming up Alabama game. And you can't really look ahead because no. it's just as good a team as Kentucky. Absolutely, and they want they they want to get that number one spot. You know what right. I'm saying? Like they they want another another feather in their cap. They've done enough to get a really good seed in the NCAA tournament, but you always want more. Um, and I, I think that they they are tuned up and ready. Um, Coach Paris is going to throw different looks. He has a pulse of his team like no other. Um, and you saw that in the Florida game when they switched up and went zone, and they don't even like playing zone. They went to a one-three-one, and it paid off, and they came back and beat Florida. So, be prepared for anything. You got to go out there and play, man. And that veteran, those veterans, got to step up like they did. Santi, Josiah, Zakai, Jamayshack. List goes on and on. When you you mentioned what this team is and has become, I think it's more uh, polished, as you said a second mm-hmm. ago. But you mentioned like Florida. I think y'all were talking about it Saturday night, like. How did Florida get blasted by 20 points? And they got all these big-time players. Yeah. But is that a testament how strong the Vols are? Or Florida's just now catching their stride, too? Because they can be problematic in these SEC tournament, too. Yeah, you, you caught them early, but at the same time, you some some days the team got your number. And I think UT had their number. I think it would be different right now if they played um, because of the size that they have. They know each other. I thought then they were still waiting to see what Will Richards was going to bring consistently. Kugel, what was he going to be? Who was going to be the main guy between Pullen and Clayton Jr.? Like, it was a lot going on. You had a a, um, a, a, a rotational issue as far mm-hmm. as the front line go because you had four bigs that you can play at any given time. So I think Golden, Coach Golden understands his guys um, a little bit more. They understand him, what's, what's wanted, um, and what's needed to get a victory. So I think they're a different team. And that, to me, they're one of the most dangerous teams 
You know what I mean? Like, people talking about USF and things of that nature. Florida's right there with them. But there's, there was another thing that happened in that Bama game, too, from this past weekend. They pretty much played five guards, five fours, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Was that another key that was – I mean, another door that was unlocked as far as Barnes is concerned, considering – both the bigs had foul trouble yeah. too, and they. I think they made a run yeah. when they had the five small five flat. I think is what y'all call it. Yeah, and let me get my basketball term. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, Tell my dog what a cross dog is. I see my boy. I see my boy. I see my boy always right there soaking it up. I think, man, you saw this early in the year um, when you looked at in, in Maui when they were playing Purdue and the bigs got in foul trouble. When they played Kansas, they got in foul trouble. You had to move your side to the five spot. Estrella had to come in and buy some minutes for you. And I think they learn from those situations. So when you when people talk about, you know, making a soft non-conference schedule, that can help. I think the same goes for the opposite. If you think you got a veteran team and you're going to take some lumps and some losses, you can learn through those losses. And I think they were able to do that by, by seeing a guy like Josiah be able to play the five and understand what we're trying to get. You know, we're not going to be posting you up, but we got to use it to our advantage. And you don't do, you don't know that if you don't play against Edie or Hunter Dickerson and guys of that nature. So – it, it it all paid off uh, well for him, and, you know, you're seeing the results of it now. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. He is 3HL and SEC Network's Ron Slay. Television's Ron Slay is on the 104.5 The Zone uh, FM radio dial and 104.5 The Zone TV weekdays from 3 to 6. Thank you, sir. Thank Thanks, you, Will Lee. Appreciate y'all. KK, hot Miami. I see you That's down right. there. I see you down there. Where I see you holding it down. Back like at it. it tomorrow morning. We'll have Rhett Bryan. We'll have ESPN's Matt Miller. We'll have you as well because we know you'll be back. And Ramon Foster's back with Words of Wisdom. Right you got to remember, good people, at all times, your Twitter fingers and your mic is always hot. Hot.